but uh, I hate when my mic doesn't work right. It just makes me crazy. I'm, I just go crazy. <clears throat> and I'm already not doing well because of my cold. But I'm here. I can't let the people down. Who's the people, are you? I am the people. The listeners are me. Uh, okay. Here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist, so it's imperative, especially in these times, that you support All the shows that you love, but especially this one. In in exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. Sometimes it's like almost uh, 30 to 40, 50, 60 extra minutes a week for those uh, $5 and up. You get an RSS feed that you can easily put into your your podcatcher. And then we also give you commercial-free uh, podcast 128 stereo. It sounds great. Much, you know, if you're if you're listening on the big feed, you're missing out. So five bucks a month. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WAL News or in our Facebook group or Discord channel. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Please be warned that the show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we're going to bring you North Korea. We're going to talk a little bit more about net neutrality. Harry's got some strong words to say for the people. Yeah. We're also going to... Uh, what else are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Trump and Pocahontas, and we're going to talk about uh, all kinds of fun things. You have a large, large list here. You're going to have leftovers like Thanksgiving. Yeah, so, and then the Consumer Protection Bureau. Yeah, we have... Uh, I have a stack of stuff like Rush... Uh, I have a whole stack of things that we're just not even going to get to. We're just going to do the four subjects this time, and then we're going to... Uh, I need to do, like, a leftover show. Harry Price is my co-host, by the way. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Harry. Um, I need to do, like, a leftover show, but we can't We can't add... Uh, trust me, the statistics won't allow me to add a third show. We're, we've, we've not lost any people. Our average is still up a little bit. Mm-hmm. With the, because I was really nervous that if you add a second show, you cannibalize your numbers because people go, "This is too much." I'm unsubscribing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, fortunately, that has not happened. But I think what I'm going to do is, when we have too much news, like we have, if we literally have ten stories that I want to do that we're not going to get to tonight, maybe I should put like do a single solo show. Do a solo show like Miranda on her new private Snapchat mm-hmm. uh, on the Chris <laughs> on the Chris Spangle Show feed. So, uh, if you didn't know there was a Chris Spangle Show feed, check it out. There is. Um, Which a lot of people go to that one just to hear you talk about podcasting stuff, though. Yeah. So I essentially, basically, just put in you know a lot of how to podcast stuff on there. So if my voice sounds funky, it is because my voice is funky. I, uh, uh, as I told you last week, had some, uh, I had a sinus infection, and so we are uh, just, I'm struggling. My voice is struggling right now, Harry. Yeah. I, may, I may have to stop and cough a lot. It's, it's normal, par for the course. Right. But, you know. Did you have a good, fun, fun Thanksgiving, though? I did. I had a great, great Thanksgiving. How about you? It was great, great. It was awesome. Uh, I got to be the uh, creepy uncle in the corner talking about, you know, like, you know politics and uh, uh, libertarianism and all kinds of different stuff. And then uh, my um, mother brought over her, you know, her crazy friend, and we got to talk. And we sat in the, you know, in the kitchen and went to all conspiracy theories while everyone was doing dishes and trying to get rid of us. I didn't talk about politics once. It was great. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine by me. I, I like, I was ready for the break. Mm-hmm. I took four days of not reading the news. It was really nice. Mm-hmm. So, but we don't have that luxury this week. We've got too much to talk about, Harry. You're right. I'm sorry. We uh, we should start with North Korea. Uh, I I really the so Republic. The only reason I want to do this story. Mm-hmm. Is, is, what'd you say? The Republic. Yeah. To dig at people who keep going to the United States Republic. Yep, so is North Korea. <laughs> exactly. 
I know. I like those people. We're we're a republic, not a democracy. Those people are like grammar Nazis to me. Mm-hmm. Like I know, I get it. Mm-hmm. You're just really bothering me. Um, <clears throat> so North Korea launched a uh, a rocket, and this one this is actually a really big deal. Okay, and the response from Trump, as I heard the press conference, a few things stood out to me that are that concerned me. You okay. Which we'll get to, but first, uh, North Korea today, just a few hours ago, fired off a, n- a missile, not a nuclear missile, but a missile. The missile took off from Pyongyang, a town northeast of Pyongyang, a capital, at 3.17 a.m., and it flew east for about 53 minutes before landing off of Honshu, Japan's largest island, nearly 600 miles from the launch site. The missile was fired high into the air, reaching a maximum altitude of around 2,800 miles, and an arc similar to the North's two previous intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, which were launched in July. Uh, they're much longer. David Wright, a senior scientist at the United Union of Concerned Scientists, said the missile performed better than the two fired in July with a potential range of more than 8,000 miles, able to reach Washington or any other part of the continental United States. It's pretty impressive, he said of the flight. This is building on what they've done before. It's muscle flexing to show the U.S. that they're going to continue to make progress. Uh, they, they probably fitted it with a mock payload, essentially mm-hmm. that was next to nothing to show that this rocket could go far. Yeah. And with an actual nuclear payload, it wouldn't probably go as far. But people are saying that this could reach the east coast of the United States. That's how, how, it, it's how high it got. Right. How much altitude it achieved. So the other part of this is that they did it at night, mm-hmm. and in every other missile test, they essentially roll these missiles out for days mm-hmm. and signal that they're going to do it. This one, they didn't do that. They just rolled it out at night, filled, and they filled the gas up horizontally as it was laying on the truck bed, and then shot it off. And so there was no warning that this was coming, whereas South Korea, Japan, and the United States had warning before. Yeah. So this is a pretty significant yeah. rocket. Yeah, because usually it's a, yeah, it's that show of force or show like that muscle flex. And this one was like, did they could they do this at night? Could we do this at darkness if we had to? Right. You know, how fast could we actually do this? And it's like that's that's why it's concerning. So this comes after just an, another round of really tight sanctions, and Trump's Asia trip, which everybody kind of expected after his trip to Asia that it would uh, he, he he Trump doesn't call him short and fat but that the little short fat man mm-hmm. in North Korea would launch a rocket. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, that's why this one is like, it's very weird, and it is right after that, you know, of Trump labeling uh, North Korea as a, what is it, the, um, the supplier of terrorism, or the one of the people that helped terrorism go out and do that. So it's... <coughs> Oh, Did I, sorry. That was, sorry. Yeah, that I'm was. I'm dying over here. I'm literally dying, Harry. It's okay. It's okay. <coughs> and, and and when you do die, you know, I want you to know we will carry on. Look at me. I am Harry. <laughs> I am the leader now. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has changed. <laughs> you will listen to me. Uh a few few reasons, yes, you could be concerned that this could reach the eastern seaboard. Mm-hmm. But you really have to understand that North Korea but it, is... Go ahead. Yeah, but it's a concern if it hits the western coast, too. Exactly know, right. Which is how high it gets. But like the other thing is, like, can it get the, the payload in there? How much resources do they really spend in this guy? Right. No, no, no. I live in the eastern part of the United States, so that's what I care about. Yeah. If you live in... if Let's be honest. If they hit California with a rocket, would we be sad? We would send thoughts and prayers. <laughs> okay? Oh, I would thoughts and prayers so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and depends on if it's no, no, NorCal or so, uh, SoCal. Right. Southern California, oh, no, not Finland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just but, ca- stay away from the technology up north. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, if you're going to go north, aim for, like, Oregon. Yeah. Not and Washington, because I like Amazon. Yeah, And that's why the, uh, it's all weird about this whole, like, uh, BPRK thing, is because when that uh, soldier defected over from North Korea to the South Korea side, like, when they got into the hospital, they were finding, like, massive, like, worms <coughs> inside of this guy's gut, his intestine tract, yeah. and found this guy's liver was shedding down. This was, like, was one of their soldiers. This was, Yeah, well, and it, you have to understand, in North Korea, to be a soldier is to be in... in you may not be in the very top class... Mm-hmm. That's for reserved for rich people and, and super supporters of Kim. Then the next class is scientists. Mm-hmm. Below that is soldiers. 
somewhere around then kind of like if you there's a whole community of Japanese who went you know Japan occupied Korea before World War II and so it's a very nice way of saying the way Japan was over in Korea <clears throat> yeah well occupied is the right word but they were what would you call it <sighs> um, subjugating, oppressing the Korean people, bastardize their language. Um, oh yeah, erasing their heritage. Their heritage, everything, yeah. just destroyed everything in Korea. So there's there was a large population of Japanese. They are somewhere on the social rank of soldiers, uh, and for whatever reason. But the Japanese families always have done better because they they had uh, Japanese currency mm-hmm. when the switch took place. And there's actually a lot of Japanese, there's a lot of North Koreans as well. There's a whole district of North Koreans that are North Korean who are educated in Japan at private schools. So, so even, even a hun, almost a hundred years later, those ties still exist. But then there's, and then there's like everybody else, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, farmers below that, workers, and then there's kind of an untouchable class. So for a soldier to... Soldiers in North Korea are supposed to get the best of, but oftentimes they can't even get socks, they can't get underwear. Uh, it's, it's really untenable, because in the 90s, the North Koreans went through a, a great famine. So Kim Il-sung died in 1994, and when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, that they they lost all that state support and all that cash and mm-hmm. all those raw materials from Russia and China, and it just got cut off right at the end of the eighties, early nineties. Mm-hmm. And then Kim Il Sung died in ninety four, and then Kim Kim Jong uh, uh, Jong Il took Il. over, Il. and Il. Uh, Il. and so the economy just rapidly started to tank. And so what they did in North Korea is they instituted a policy of basically military aggression towards the United States, Japan, and South Korea as a way to keep solidarity. And so they just continually build up new build, new, new military threats mm-hmm. to kind of keep everybody in line because the threat of war keeps everybody from really freaking out too much. So that's what these that's what this is about. These are propaganda rockets. And it is an effort to keep a hold on the society. What you have to understand is that once China kind of got its footing under itself in the 2000s, they started to support North Korea, and it lifted them out of that great famine, where you had millions die in North Korea. Nobody really knows how many people died in North Korea at that time, but it was millions, they think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was genocide in the northern part of, basically, Kim Jong-il just cut off the food to the northern part of North Korea. And the the money and the resources from China started to flow in and lift people, lift them out of poverty. Now, they still go through cycles like any economic cycle does, even though they're a communist well, country, economic laws still apply. Yeah, they just can't, can't escape the... the, the the flaws of communism. Right. They, they hit it and they hit them hard. Yeah. That's why the, the black market in um, North Korea is so strong and they've got, like, they have to let it go through because if they don't, people will starve. Sure. You know, they under, you know, it's, um, and if they starve, they'll riot. So there's like, well, the black market's bringing cash in. The mm-hmm. black market's bringing that in. Just leave them alone or make them pay off soldiers. And that's why the soldiers always get paid. Sure. So, exactly right. So, North Korea is totally dependent on China. Yep. The, the, they're the ones that they trade with. Although North Korea will trade with Egypt, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. some of the Middle Eastern countries will trade with North Korea, and that's why they always end up on the state-sponsored terror list, is that they do send weapons and other things over to mm-hmm. these Middle Eastern countries, or they just export their raw materials to these Middle Eastern countries, that, which then fashion weapons, and that's how they get on, on the state-sponsored uh, terror list. Uh, <clears throat> it's not because of the rockets totally it's because of that so they are they're they're just they're never going to act unilaterally and china is never going to let the ill the sung dynasty essentially disappear and the reason is that china can't handle that influx of there's 25 million people in north korea mm-hmm. south korea has 50 million people and they're kind of out of space Right. And China 
does not want all those all those people flooding in a refugee crisis into their economy because for what you for, for all the all that you hear about China's economy growing and it certainly is a lot of the way that they measure their GDP there is based on building on construction mm-hmm. and that's why they have these entire ghost towns you know there's one city outside of Beijing that's like built just like Paris and nobody lives in it you know they've built it across China all these cities that's equipped for like 5 million people but 30,000 people live there so they really aren't as economically strong as everybody lets on correct but th- so they can't handle the instability of uh, a Korean war and China is never going to let them unilaterally act to fire on the United States this is all saber rattling on Un's part to keep control of his nation so I I wanted to introduce with this because I think it's really important because it we're about to enter a period with North Korea where you're going to Harry and I are are men of certain ages mm-hmm. and we were alive during the uh, Iraq war lead up yep. and uh, you know I just remember I mean I was I was pro war uh, because I was twenty and stupid <laughs> I didn't know any better but. But I and I remember how I thought and treated people who were anti-war and how society treated them. Like it, it's a really uh, and now as an as a non-interventionist, I know what's coming, and I, I don't I don't like it, <laughs> and I'm not looking forward to it because if you are non-interventionist in a period of war, you are unpatriotic. You are you're just you're you're treated like scum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah. I mean, it really sucked. I mean, do you have any memories of that period? Were you political at all during the Iraq lead-up? Yes, I was. But, like, during that time, <coughs> let's see, what was that, Oh four, three. Oh three. No three. let's see, if I remember correctly, I was just out of uh, getting out of high school, so I was in that, like, that, weird, uh, that weird stretch of myself where I was tra- transferring over between, like, leaving, like, the, you know, the Democrat way of thinking and moving more over to the Republican side. Yeah. So it was more of that, I was really in that cross of, like, well, I can see why we're fighting, but, you know, but I still, we need to, like, so I was kind of, like, rocking the fence back then. Mm-hmm. And that, and then eventually, while well, 04, I was like, no, no, we need them, we need to go over there and hit them and bomb them before they come here and bomb us. Right. How did you become a non-interventionist? Basically, just you know, if I'm honest, Ron Paul. Ron Paul. It's Ron usually Paul. it's how, how it happened for me too. You know, granted, like I've well, learned all these things are done about peace, but it was more like, but still, we need to be over there and bomb them. But wait a minute, hold on, let's think about this stuff. Right. <laughs> let's re- let's re- let's rewind a lot of the tape and like and really study about blowback and differences like that. And it's yeah. I mean, I spent the weekend watching Vice on HBO, not the news, but the actual series, and you just. You, everywhere that they go in the Middle East, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where they're at. As they're talking to citizens, it's like, well, we're he- we we fight because of the Americans are here. Like, at, at a certain point, it just, like, for the people in the Middle East, it just became, well, they're occupiers. We have to fight them. Right. You know, and that is the concept of blowback. And I had never really even considered, in, in all of my... Uh, consternation and thought and and uh, convulsions over the Iraq war, I never took a moment to sit there and think, like, what about an actual human being in Iraq? Because that's not what you're trained to do. That's not what a good, quote-unquote, patriot does mm-hmm. in a time of war. You don't sit there and think about the enemy and humanize them. The whole point is to propagandize them to the point that they're dehumanized. And... If you if you watch any documentary, if you read anything about the North Korean people, you feel a tremendous amount of empathy for them. They're a very moral society. They're mm-hmm. very good people that have just some really oppressive, horrible leaders that had some very good breaks to build a society that kept them in power. Right. And that's all they're doing now. Yeah. Now, with, hopefully with um, the likes of uh, like what happened in Zimbabwe, the mm-hmm. Naku that happened there, hopefully some interaction or some peaceful evolution, like the military would step in, take them out, and, you know, just try to do this peaceful transition of power. You, if, you, but, if you've ever read 1984, mm-hmm. that is exactly what North Korean society is like. There are so many minders and monitors and, and surveillance systems set up that it's nearly impossible for that society. <laughs> and, and the Kim Jong-un, his family is so wealthy... And they have, like, 
ten mansions around. I mean, they're so wealthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, the the amount of gold that they have stockpiled is kind of like Gaddafi in Libya. Now, that didn't do him much good, but it took a regional uprising for a Gaddafi, uh, uh, you know, all these different leaders, like in Egypt, um, to, to get toppled. You're not going to have a regional thing like that in North Korea. That's why it's so unique. And that's why you really have to remember it is it, it is not our problem. It is kind of China's problem to police their own neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And if we preemptively strike them on, on the hypothetical that they might do something that they likely will not do, yeah. then it becomes our problem like Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is what the huge risk is with North Korea. Yeah. Nobody wants the 25 million people. Right. You know, or like, or like, it, it'd be okay if, like, I'd say, like, the, like, the, I think the one country <coughs> in the world that could do something with it would be the United States. But, right. but the China and, and Russia would not want, you know, North Korea turning into a U.S. territory. Right. They don't want us over there as much as, you know, as much as they, they don't want, you know, much, as much as they don't want to deal with it, they don't want us, ha- not, not us. Um, the United States government. Sorry, I meant to say us. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 us, us, and the Statism. government. Are two Gross. different people, right? <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, so the state, right, having like a territory or a base right there, smack dab, like not a, you know, so they have to get, you know, since it's a tip. Ter- oh. <laughs> you, you just accidentally. Get off, get off. Mittens is taking a nap in Harry's uh, yeah. bag, and he accidentally just hit her. Violated her nap. Yeah, you violated the hell out of my cat's nap. And then, um, In both ways. Yeah, because you would have to let them have trade roads, so that means China has to be okay with, since it's a military base, to let military boats go right up the peninsula yep. and park. Yep. Okay? They're kind of okay because it's, you know, South Korea, it's okay, whatever, we get that, yeah. we get that far close. Granted, they have no ch- you know, they don't want to, like, fight a war with the United <laughs> States, but the last thing you want is a potential enemy to park, you know, like, missiles and everything else right next to your border. Yeah, they don't, they don't want... They've played risk. Re- yeah, they don't want a regional intrusion, mm-hmm. and, like, if you look at what's going on in the South China Sea, where China has just claimed the South China Sea for themselves against our wishes, against the wishes of Indonesia and mm-hmm. every other country in the South Indonesian and the South China Sea, like they just say it's ours. And they've just start they've started building these islands mm-hmm. and putting people on these islands and fishing and like they don't they just don't care because who's gonna stop them? It's kind of like Russia and the Ukraine. Who's gonna stop them? Mm-hmm. Nobody stopped Putin. Putin doesn't give a give a crap about the UN or the United States. Like, every, all these big powers kind of know at this point, America is so over-leveraged militarily, mm-hmm. and that they're not going to take the risk. Like, right. Iraq and Afghanistan completely exposed that, yes, you may be the biggest military on paper, but you have so overextended yourself that your people will no longer, they're not geared up to fight a war, they don't want to fight a war, and you, you're just bleeding cash in mm-hmm. places like, like Afghanistan and in Iraq and, and these seven other places that we're, we're you know, engaged in. Yep. And China is a non-interventionist country. Like, if you really look at China's foreign policy, the way that their foreign policy works is, like, name one country that China occupies. Like, other than, what is it, it's, not, it's a Taiwan? Taiwan, technically. And Tibet? Yeah. But whoa, whoa, whoa! They don't occupy the Tibet. They they have Tibet, <laughs> right? But and, and Tibet trying to get the China one day. There's a dispute over Tibet, which is a tiny island. But if you look at America, we're heavily engaged now. They still sell arms. Mm-hmm. If you go to the Middle East and you look at Yemen, for instance, uh, Saudi Arabia buys a lot of weapons from China. You know, essentially, the United States is first and foremost in spreading weapons around the world, and Russia and China are right behind them. And you want to sell these weapons because you want to sell the parts too, mm-hmm. um, and and but China doesn't interfere in, in foreign policy too much, and what you what they're doing is like they're they they go look up the stadiums in China like Chinese stadiums that have been built all across Africa. Oh yeah. So yes, what they yeah. do is they just go build soccer stadiums mm-hmm. for like a place like the Congo, mm-hmm. and. Uh, the, the Stadium of the Martyrs or something, which is a very Congo name. But uh, China just invests heavily in all these countries, mm-hmm. gives jobs to the people of Africa, builds them stadiums, 
And then people are like, yeah, we like the Chinese. They don't push us around and tell us what to do, like the IMF mm-hmm. and the United States and the UN. Mm-hmm. Like we'd much rather have the Chinese help than the Americans help. Yeah, and Africa, they also take the um, black women over there and bring mm-hmm. them over to China because of the Chinese one-child policies. Yeah, so there's a lot of like men in there with no wives. Like they it was going through that crisis of wife sharing, and yeah. then they like, wait a minute, we just bring black women from China, from Africa. Over. Yeah, you know, it's easier. Yeah, but you are right. Yeah, they, and they went over there. They uh, they do economic development, so they get new trade partners, and they realize that, you know, it's if you build up this country, you know, and you let them trust you because they want you, they'll give you cash, uh-huh. they'll give you money, they'll be a trade, they'll be your trade partner, right? And then if any other other these Middle Eastern countries try to screw you over for trade routes, whatever, I'll just go right through you. Yep, go right through you. Exactly. So China's not using their military might; they're using their economic might. And mm-hmm. look how fast their economy is growing. Yeah. So, it, it, and it's crazy. And it's like all. And you talk about a country back in like what this is the nineteen fifties had a massive famine, losing all bunch of people. Communists is all hell, and just decided to take the ideas of I don't know free market capitalism to a, just a little extent and just kind of let it go wild and leave it alone. Yeah, and and that's really the model that we ought to be following. I mean, not the communist model, but. Well, the, not I, trying to be the world's policeman. Yeah, not trying to be the world's policeman and just let the market do on its own. You know, like because like uh, communist China is still there, but the United, but their government understands that if they mess with anything inside those zones, anything with the economic ability, it would dry up overnight. Yeah, people would move those businesses out of it, just kind of like what Coca Cola did to get it the heck out of Venezuela. It got out quick. It yeah, fast switch over. Uh, so I'm ap- I apologize to our video viewers because the the board is acting up and I, I don't have uh, a good plug in to the Mevo. But for the other thousands of people listening, you're going to hear a press conference and uh, with Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. The second voice you'll hear is Paul Ryan. The third voice you'll hear is Mitch McConnell. The fourth is James Mattis. I don't know that we'll get that far because we're not going to play too much of this. Um, I want you to listen for a couple things. So if you are old enough to remember the invasion of Iraq and the lead up to Iraq, there was this period where everybody knew that America was going to invade Iraq. Like it was a done deal and military action was going to happen. And we like, you can't mobilize that many soldiers, that much equipment without like tipping people off (laughs) and calling up the guard and things. Uh, so, especially in a free country with an open press like ours, mm-hmm. um, but the, the rhetoric changed at a certain point, and I, I've started to see the, the foreign policy team of Donald Trump and Donald Trump himself have that shift. So, you know, and I was reading, uh, actually just threw it away, Axios... You know, Axios said, you know, at this stage, calling on North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons and missile no longer counts as serious diplomacy, because they're not doing it. Yeah. Uh, the Trump administration should make clear what it is willing to offer in exchange for such a freeze, whether sanctions relief, a formal end to the state of war, or an adjustment to the U.S.-South Korean military exercises. Now, let me explain these, because these are actually really smart ideas. So, it, what has happened in the past, Madeleine Albright, when Clinton, you know, after that military buildup in 1994 90, and starting to be an aggressive state, the Clinton administration struck a deal with Kim Jong-il. And it involved just giving them a bunch of cash and resources and sanction relief, and, and, and it calmed them down for a period of years because what was happening is they needed to get lifted out of that famine. Mm-hmm. And everybody on the world stage kind of knew, like, they're just doing this to get money so they don't, like, go under as a regime. Mm-hmm. And so Madeleine Albright went and actually visited Kim Jong-il, and they struck a deal with them that included a lot of these things, and they stopped creating nuclear weapons for a period of time, which this North Korean deal is kind of like what a lot of the, uh, the criticisms over the Iran deal, like, look at North Korea. They kept building nuclear weapons and IB- right. ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So... Uh, so this is way too rational mm-hmm. for the Trump administration. Like, Rex Tillerson could figure this out, but I don't think Donald will. Uh, the Trump administration should, uh, what is it going to give them, essentially, to calm down? Like, a tantruming child, what are you going to give them? A formal end of the state of war. We're technically still at war with them. We just have a ceasefire on the uh, 1954 North Korean, South Korean War, uh, the Korean War. 
and uh, or an adjustment to the U.S. South Korean military exercises. We do a tremendous amount of military exercises in in South Korea. Mm -hmm. We're doing them to Russia, to China, to you know, to Iran, Iraq, and ISIS. We're do well. We have active military there, but uh, but. We do these military exercises, and what it does is it just freaks North Korea out. Mm -hmm. Like a Putin goes, okay, yeah, you're doing military exercises. Watch this. We I'll put this, I'll put seventy six thousand troops on on you know the border of Poland and do a military exercise, which he did. Mm -hmm. And uh, or just get a sub to go like, so where's international waters end here? Exactly, Ooh, exactly right. Here real quick, <laughs> exactly right. And so, it, it, but North Korea doesn't have that sophistication, and you should not underestimate Kim Jong Un. He's actually he's he was educated in Switzerland. He speaks multiple languages. He is not a dumb person by any stretch of the imagination. He is not an irrational actor. He's not a crazy person. He's a, 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 a despot who is trying to hold on to power. And uh, he's not like Paris Hilton where they ruined the third generation. He's the youngest of the three sons. And he was chosen. That's alive. That, that's alive. The other two somehow are dead. Uh, Strange, but he was chosen because he was the most, he was the brightest, and so he's not a dumb person. He should be, he should be, um, he he can be reasoned with. The guy just wants to stay in power, and so there's the moral cost there that every person listening has to like figure out for themselves. Okay, so if you study, it, like if you read the great book by, uh, uh, the, you know. What, what is that book that I just raved about? Barbara, uh, Nothing to Envy. It was a great book. Uh, and it was about the life of North Koreans over the past 50 years. You see how much suffering there is. And it, enabling him to stay in power, it, all that does is keeps him in power and keeps another t 10 to 20 years of quote-unquote peace Mm -hmm. where you're kind of extending it, hoping that he fails and you have a failed state, and then he picks it back up. But that extends the misery of the North Korean people. Yeah. But the reality is that if you militarily attack them, look at Iraq. Do you think that the, the, like, the biggest problem with Iraq and Afghanistan, the reason that we will never have, we will never have quote-unquote victory in, in those locations is because they feel completely betrayed by America, mm -hmm. by the American government. Like, in Afghanistan, you sit there and you hear about all the schools that we've built and all the progress that has been made for women and blah, blah, blah. Well, like, the average Afghan just thinks, like, well, you, you heard it a couple episodes ago where George was basically saying, I was willing to sit and barter, but the majority of my, my uh, colleagues, my fellow soldiers, were not. And the faces of every Afghan fell when we would walk out of every room like that. And that's been going on for almost 20 years now. So you, you have it, and you've completely let opium come back. Mm -hmm. So opium now, you know, opium, heroin, basically, yeah. makes up 60% of Afghanistan's economy. Yeah. economy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the world's first true narco state, and it's our fault. And you have to wonder how much of that contributes to our own opioid problem. So, so... Doing something militarily does not necessarily mean that there's going to be humanitarian relief for the North Koreans, mm -hmm. you know, and you have a population of people who are not like a fourth generation of, it's not like Egypt, where you have this huge group of young people who are ready to fight, who are young and hungry. Like, the majority of the young people in North Korea are m massively deformed or deficient because of growing up in a in a starvation state. Right, yeah. They're, They're hungry, but for different reasons. Exactly right. They're hungry for food. Exactly. So the, they were eating sawdust and bark. They literally would kill pine trees because they would eat the bark off the trees. Oof. I mean, that's that's a level of hunger you can't imagine. Yeah. So it's... And it just shows you the failure of communi communism. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's truly a tragic tale, but they're short of... There's just not really a good solution. And that's sometimes the problem with being a non-interventionist. There isn't really a good solution. <laughs> you know, I can't sit here and say, like, here's what we ought to do. 
we should give them a bunch of American money. Well, I don't like that as I don't like that as a taxpayer. Right. And I don't like the morality of extending their misery. Correct. But I certainly don't like the option of sending American troops to the South to South Korea to invade another country mm-hmm. and inherit another forty year quagmire. Correct. So there really isn't a great solution here. Yeah. Uh, but there's gotta be like all right, with Trump spending so much time over in China, mm-hmm. we've had that had to be on the table. That had sure. to be in discussion court. Sure. Okay. And watching the coup that happened in Zimbabwe and understanding, them, like I said, that you know, it comes to a time that you know you may just need to topple the dictator over with somebody else. Just like you said, that whole regional thing that might be the way to do it. Now sending yeah. in tax money sucks. Sending in money that you've stolen from other people to pay off different uh, warlords, but you know you get warlord fighting warlord, and then you know coming in from the chaos. You know what really truly changes it? It's culture. Yeah. If you look at Cuba, Cuba, their young people love America and have a spirit of freedom and have been able over the last 20 years to change their government because of American hip-hop. They were able to pick up the radio signals from Miami radio stations, and there's a huge hip-hop culture there now. In, in the fall of the Soviet Union, it was, that, it was blue jeans. It, you, yes, it was Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul and Margaret Thatcher, and the government always takes credit for that. But more than anything, it was the fact that they started to get information seeping in, mm-hmm. and they were like, they have blue jeans? Look how good this looks. I want those. You know, and it was their desire for Western culture that, you know, I read this story one time about this guy who brought a Coca-Cola back from somewhere, and, like, the whole family got to have, like, a little taste of the Coca-Cola, like, 20 family members having this look. They're just like, this is amazing. <laughs> well, like, uh, it's like uh, people in North Korea, <laughs> usually, like, certain class members, like, who are super loyal or the richer. Right. In North Korea, they do get to spend time actually bus down to South Korea. Uh-huh. They do it once a year to see family members. Yeah, and they get both. So they see all the different stuff. But the, the only people they get to like really break that open is people who are super loyal or you know get paid or have the money to get out completely. Yeah, there's a TV show in South Korea. So a big, huge problem is that these, these North Koreans go to South Korea and they're treated like pariahs. And so a lot of defectors end up like, why did I leave for South Korea? Like, Because in North Korea, things make sense and everything is kind of structured. Mm-hmm. And everything's very, like, it's like 1950s and you could date someone for 10 years before kissing them. And then you go to South Korea and it's just like sex soaked. And so like to, to a people who like, they're... they're I mean, they're like true. They're like Mormons. Like I, I, I guess the best way when I say moral, a moral people, the way that most North Koreans live is kind of in the vein of how Mormons are. You know, just that very like, like nice, community oriented, family oriented, polite society. And then you know, and then they go to it's like Orgasmo with Matt and Trey part, or you know, like <laughs> Matt and Trey from South Park, mm-hmm. that movie they did, where like the the missionary goes to L.A. and like ends up in porno movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, that's kind of like what happens in South Korea. They just go, "What is this madness? Capitalism is gross." Kim Jong Un was right. How do I go back without getting killed? And so, uh, a South Korean TV producer said, "You know what? We should try something to to normalize them." And so they started this reality TV show that essentially uh, just shows off the talents of mm. North Koreans. A lot of them are women because it's mostly women that defect. And, uh, you know, they're all beautiful. And so, like, people started to see, like, the human side of North Koreans. And this TV show has been put on hard drives and smuggled into North Korea. And that is, like, rapidly changing because... Like, the rumor had always kind of gotten back, like, it's not better here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't want to go to China, there's no jobs. You're just, what happens when you defect to China is you get sold into marriage to a man. And then if you get to South Korea, it's, there's no job. Like, there's no economic opportunity. Uh, but now, this show is not only changing South Koreans' minds about North Koreans, and they're getting more opportunities because of it. It's sort of like the way that Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, I think, normalized for most Americans, like, for me, I'd never really seen or interacted with a gay person, but I, like, really liked the Queer Eye guys. Okay. Like, I wanted to be on that show. So, like, it really kind of normalized that and made me go, oh, okay, these guys are cool. You could have used it. You would have been growing your beard longer. Oh, yeah. Way longer, yeah. And 
so the sh- but the show's also getting smuggled into North Korea, and North Koreans are going, oh, wow, they don't, maybe those stories aren't bad. Like, maybe those stories aren't totally true. They are treating us well. Because look at these North Koreans getting respect on South Korean TV. So, mm-hmm. so culture can change this stuff. Economics can change things. Military options never change it. Yeah. You know, and so it, it, it's you know, the greatest example. I, I just, there's a book by Scott and Horton called Fool's Errand about Afghanistan, and it just really documents the last 20 years in Afghanistan and where we're at. And uh, I've not read it yet, but I've read about it a bunch, and I really like Scott Horton a lot. He has a great podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Just great interviews. Great interviews. And I highly recommend going and checking Scott out. And he writes but for Antiwar.com? Antiwar.com, and, and he's he's starting to get the... He's been around forever, but he's finally starting to get, like, onto places like Dave Smith, and hopefully he gets on, like, Joe Rogan and mm-hmm. gets... Gets the recognition that Scott Horton deserves because forever he's been that lone, like non-interventionist voice, really out there, like yeah. putting putting good information out. So, but I hear nothing but good things about that book. So I'm gonna read it. I definitely wanna wanna do that. But mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> but he's somebody I trust that I I can recommend the book without having read it because I know I know Scott's uh, substance. So if you lived through the 9-11 period, you probably are familiar with war rhetoric. And there's two things in this press conference that I think are really telling. First off, so here's the setting. Chuck and Nancy were supposed to come over with uh, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, and they were going to meet with Donald Trump, and they were going to have a conversation about uh, all kinds of different issues They were going to talk about the tax plan. They were going to talk about the omnibus spending because the government may may get shut down in December. So they're trying to figure out how to get a continuing resolution to fund the government past December. And Nancy and Chuck decided not to show up. So Trump left their chairs on either side of him. They canceled the press briefing. And they held a press conference with the president sitting in front, in between two empty chairs with their nameplates, which is great (laughs) optics. And then uh, Paul Ryan was there, Mitch McConnell, the Senate leader, was there, Paul Ryan's the House Speaker, and then James Mattis was there, who was the Defense Secretary, who presumably came over to talk about that. But what, what you will hear are two things. First, you will hear how absolutely incoherent Donald Trump is becoming, and it's worrisome. So I say that knowing full well that Donald Trump has always kind of been incoherent, but it's to a level where it's almost concerning how 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 he sounds like it, it's starting to make me concerned for his health and then second is Paul Ryan invoking soldiers in their time of need regarding the North Korea situation when they start to use the the empathy card for soldiers that's when you know that some shit's about to go down because the way that they they you, the way that you're a good patriot or a bad patriot is if you support our troops. Mm-hmm. It's never about the policy. It's about do you support the troops or not. It's not about Colin Kaepernick's point. It's about do you support the troops or not. Yeah. And they, they, if, and you see, you saw with that NFL kneeling thing, Donald Trump used that do you support the troops narrative to completely turn half of your Facebook friends into slobbering zombies. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that phrase of that question. It's like when people <coughs> talk about, like, well, the survey questions are inaccurate. They're loaded, and that's what it is. It's a loaded survey question. Exactly. It's it's wrapped in emotion because everybody knows a soldier. Yeah. So, here we go. Also odd because he's normally much more. Uh, he pokes, he pokes, but that may not have been what he wanted to. He, he he's very smart and selective in, in where he pokes, like the uh, 
like uh, the the tweet basically where he's like, I uh, uh, you know I don't ever call him short and fat. Like he knows that's going to get press. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is this, this is a reserved Trump. Which whenever Trump's quiet and reserved, I get worried. Weak on crime is what's called dog whistle politics. And weak on crime is one of those things that you will hear Donald Trump say repeatedly, especially about Doug Jones in Alabama. Because to millennials like us, when we hear weak on crime, we hear he's not good with crime. Mm -hmm. When baby boomers, white baby boomers, especially in Alabama, hear weak on crime, what they hear is black men are coming to rape your white daughters. So that's what... That it, it's it's actually a very strategic choice of words that Donald Trump uses, and it's it it's like how everybody bashed Barack Obama for using "Yes, we can." It's very propagandist mm-hmm. it, that this war on crime that he keeps he's just using it all the time now. Which is not true, because not one Democrat currently is arguing for tax increases. Uh, but so, I, so that's a very strategic propagandist point, again, that Donald Trump is putting out there, that you will start seeing repeated over and over and over from your right Facebook friends that Democrats want tax increases because they're not supporting the tax bill. Correct. That's not true. That's not what is be, uh, that's not what is on the table. It's like net neutrality, where you're arguing hypotheticals. Yeah, and if they try to come out against it, they since they don't have a bill to introduce, like well, you don't have a bill, and you're right. voting against a tax increase, so you want increase. Right. Yeah, you can't. You know, it's a no win. Right. So, and in and, and all of this, Donald Trump is not like what you have to realize about Donald Trump is he's not our president. Yeah. Donald Trump is the president for his people, and and in some ways I respect that because he's not lying to us like Barack Obama. Like, where Barack Obama was president for his people, not like Harry's people, but like leftists, Mm -hmm. where Donald Trump just doesn't give a a crap about anybody other than his base. And he plays to them. And at least he's he's somewhat authentic. He's he's inadvertently authentic in that way. But that's what something like this, they're weak on crime, they're weak on immigration, they hate the military, they want to raise taxes. Like... And we're going to get the wall. He, and we're going to get the wall. He just doesn't care what a libertarian or what a liberal or what a moderate or even a conservative thinks. He cares about his base and growing that base of people. Mm-hmm. And so he uses emotional issues to kind of br- and, and brings it out and repeats it over and over and over to kind of get a desired effect. So let's go back to the president. Senate, uh, I think it was the Finance Committee, passed the tax bill. Uh, it was a party line vote. Now it goes to the full Senate. <clears throat>
Now, that is true, and uh, that is a true point. And the, yesterday was a record-setting, like a $6 billion day for Cyber Monday. It was mm-hmm. one of the better Black Fridays in a long time, so that, that is good. Yeah, because they've been going down. What'd you say? Oh, because they were going down. We had trended down. We've been trending down the last you, few years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so to me, the Paul Ryan was when I went, uh-oh. <laughs> Two things. One, those chairs look comfy. See, oh, those, those, those are comfy chairs. Those are the kind of chairs we need in the studio. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. Second thing is, you see Paul Ryan's um, t- um, tie? That tie was nice. That's a, is that a Kekistan tie? It was, <laughs> it, was, it was the color of the Kekistan flag. It was white and green and beautiful. <laughs> I, did you, so, do you agree with me that he sounded a little feeble there? He sounded a little dotarded. A little because he was so reserved. Did it like seem like he was trying to like stick to a script that he had going on in his head instead of just going on what pops in there usually? Right, like yesterday. Yeah, like you know when he usually does. You know, adjective salad or uh, this. Yeah, right. So I don't know. I just I listening to it, and then and then this this moment yesterday, uh, it's <laughs> he, he's talking to the last of the Navajo Code talkers, and these guys helped win the war because they talked in Navajo, and it was a language that the Germans and the Russians couldn't. You know, they, they didn't know what Navajo was, and so he was there honoring the the uh, Navajo wind talkers. And he clearly just doesn't know who he's talking to. Like, he, he's just kind of lost in his day and isn't really sure what's going on. Mm-hmm. So he's looking at some Native Americans, and he, like, just... The first thing that pops into his head, let's come out. <laughs> and so, secondly, they had the press conference honoring the Navajo Wind Talkers in front of a portrait of Andrew Jackson... Who basically, if you don't know, Andrew Jackson was a genocidal maniac towards Indians. He hated Native Americans, and he killed ten thousand of them on the Trail of Tears. Allegedly, like, he allegedly, <laughs> like he's the one who moved them all from southern the southern United States over to Oklahoma. Like mm-hmm. he, he's he's hated as he's the re, it's there's a reason he's coming off the twenty dollar bill and Harriet Tubman's going on is because it's like you just can't have someone who is such a virulent homicidal, a genocidal maniac on your money. I get that, but like him being on the $20 bill is almost like, ha ha, you're on the fiat note, ha ha ha. I know, and it is, because he tried to end the in, in the central bank yeah. at that time. And yeah, I'm like, oh, you're on it now. Right. And, well, uh, it's because he, he's credited with helping found the Democratic Party with the mm-hmm. Jefferson Jackson Day dinners. That's yeah. why he was on there, but yep. still. And yeah, he cred- yeah so the... the so every time, so like, that's why I said, like, the biggest, like, lie you could get onto is ever from the Democratic Party is go on the website, like, we have supported civil rights for 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so it really is just, it. this is, like, I'm just at a point with Trump where I don't even, like, you can't, I, when people say they're outraged, I just think they're full of crap. Like, I just don't think that outrage is an actual emotion. Like, Harry, you know me. 
I have every emotion known to the human being in every single day, right? You have 55 shades of triggered. <laughs> right. I've never been outraged in my life. I can't think of a time I've ever been outraged. So when people get outraged by Trump after twenty after twenty months of Trump, mm-hmm. I just go, "There's you're, you're, how are you uh, like this is what he does." Yeah, like this is just at some point you just have to either roll your eyes and go, "This guy," mm-hmm. or laugh. Which I just was like, "What is he doing? What is he like your drunk uncle?" Yeah, really, he just needs to hire somebody to do the talking for him. He just whispers in someone's ear, right. and they just like, "Let me clean that up for you." Yeah, <laughs> I think the shuffling is coming soon. God forbid Donald Trump die in office because we do not need the Kennedy Lincoln effect when with Donald Trump and this becoming. It would be. It would be cemented into... Trumpsonian era. Tr- oh, yeah. Like, the Trump ideology and the Trump politics would be just cemented into our American politics. It would be such a disaster. So pray for Donald Trump's health. I just can't wait to, like, the next election cycle when, er- when so many other people try to copy the same, like, the, the playbook. Right. When everyone's like, okay, I've got to do it. I've been hitting with memes. You know, right. get me, give me 15 high schoolers, a bunch of four loco. <laughs> you can't give four loco to high school students. We're giving four loco to high school students, okay? Exactly. <laughs> I, I want memes. <coughs> so, so this is what the President of the United States said to a group of Native American heroes as they were being honored at the White House in front of an Andrew Jackson picture. White privilege. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what? It, it's just clear to me like he didn't have prepared remarks and didn't. He doesn't know who the Navajo Wind are. He never saw the movie. Like, you don't know that he probably ate soda now, so I see the movie. He just got the cliff notes and the walk over here. That's, but that's how Trump's foreign policy, military policy, it's all done by movies that he saw in the 1950s, like, Torah, Torah, Torah. 1950s. 1960s. Like, <laughs> to him, Patton is, like, his version of Sun Tzu. <laughs> like, that's how he forms foreign policy, is his old war movies. <laughs> How did John Ford? How would John Ford handle the North Korean crisis? That's that's how he designs policy. Are you okay? No. <laughs> Take your uh, let the laughter be heard. <laughs> Harry's crying. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> it is. Patton is. That's why. Like Jim Mattis is Jim Mattis not Patton. He is the closest thing to American Patton, oh, uh, like the modern Patton that we have. Oh, so okay, I'm, good. I'm back. So here's it, this Pocahontas thing. <coughs> um, you probably mm. heard it. You mm-hmm. probably heard him say it a few times. So uh, in March of 2016, she she criticized him on Twitter. She's got about as much Indian blood as I have. Her whole life was based on a fraud. She got into Harvard and all that because she was a minority. Uh, June 2016 on Twitter, Crooked Hillary is wheeling out one of the least productive senators in the U.S. Senate, Goofy Elizabeth Warren, who lied on heritage. June 2016, at a campaign rally in Virginia. Pocahontas is not happy. She's not happy. She's the worst, you know, Pocahontas. I'm doing such a disservice to Pocahontas. It's so unfair to Pocahontas, but this Elizabeth Warren. I call her goofy. Elizabeth Warren, she's one of the worst senators in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and, and, you know, Republicans were outraged, because this was the early days of Trump, where we were like, oh, this guy's starting to win. We need mm-hmm. to deal with him, and uh, so here's the the background on the Pocahontas thing. So in 96, Harvard Law School touted Elizabeth Warren, then a professor at the university, as being Native American in a letter responding to criticism of the school's lack of minority women. Apparently she checked the Native American box. The rumor is that she checked the Native American box when she applied at Harvard. Mm-hmm. And this, this happens. Like, I worked at a radio station where they put me down as Native American because I told them I was 116th. Cherokee and Choctaw, and so they put me down as Native American for the EEO file for the Equal Opportunity Employment Act. So I'm I'm like Elizabeth Warren too, basically. But like, so then in 2012 when ran uh, against Scott Brown, who was the Republican that miraculously beat uh, that took over for Ted Kennedy, 
Uh, yeah. Are you saying like you and Abdul were uh, token EOC hires? If 100%. Knew it. No, 100%. Uh, so the former GOP senator that Warren unseated, and Scott Brown is the current ambassador to New Zealand and Samoa, which is a cushy gig. Like, if I were going to be, if I had a job, it would be the U.S. ambassador to mm-hmm. New Zealand and Samoa. Like, you wouldn't have to work. Everything would be paid for you, and you'd be in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, he used Warren's self-proclaimed Native American heritage to question her integrity. In 2016, Brown also said Warren should take a DNA test if she wants to prove <laughs> her heritage. 23 and me it. Warren defended her claims, telling NPR in 2012 that while growing up in Oklahoma, her family always told her she's part Cherokee. These are my family stories. This is our lives, and I'm very proud of it. That's how she talks. She has a very weird way of talking. Um, However, she said she didn't have documentation to prove it. Fact checkers attempted to trace her ancestry, but after several failed attempts, the consensus was that there is no documented evidence to support she is of Native American heritage. Experts have also noted that any such evidence is difficult to prove to begin with, and the Cherokee Nation has looked into it, and they have, they, uh, they do not think that she's Cherokee. Until they need her to be. uh, (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, so Trump just picked up on it and started calling her Pocahontas. Yeah, what you gonna do? (laughs) What you gonna do? Defend it. (laughs) Defend it or fight it, or come out against it. You know, that's the other thing, it's like, you know, you have to, in order to shut yeah, Trump down, you've got to shut, shut it down like you either troll. Don't play the game. Shut his game down. That's that's really the way to handle Trump. It, it, and it's the way to handle any troll. Yeah. You just stop paying attention to them. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the, like, being outraged at Donald Trump, like, listen, I think he's immoral, he's unethical, mm-hmm. like, his hotel in Dubai was built with slave labor, he underpays his workers... He paid off every construction company in New York. He, he was in bed with the mob. Like, it's everyone in New York, though. I know. In Chicago. I know, but I'm saying, like, the guy isn't, like, some profound moral leader. Oh, yeah. a- a- and he has become that to a certain voting segment of our population because the people that they hate are constantly bitching about him. Mm-hmm. And so people like me who are, who, like... I don't have anything, I, like Donald Trump, like I think some of the justice, like Neil Gorsuch was a win, uh, the appointment of federal society judges to the bench is going to be good for the Constitution, mm-hmm. uh, the, the deregulation has been very good, like so there's some things that I think that he's done well, but by and large, he. I, I also think this, this tricky, uh, so basically the way that they have... Um, so a, a way of killing something in government, if you pass a law that the other party passes a law and you don't like it, you can just choose not to fund it. So even if a bill gets passed into law, this happens at the local, state, and federal level, you can just choose, it's called an unfunded, you know, it, it's just like it's not funded. Yeah. So fin- effectively the law never gets implemented because it never gives gets money. Mm-hmm. What Trump is effectively doing is he is not staffing the federal government. And so he's just kind of... It, with labor, he's not he's defunding the government labor wise. So he's just not hiring people, and uh, he's putting in hiring freezes and everything. So, so it's some of that stuff. I think from a libertarian perspective, that's good because that's a a, a, a de escalation of of the growth of government that we saw mm-hmm. under Donald Trump or uh, Barack Obama. But so you will eventually be able to say the growth of government under Donald Trump, <laughs> right? Years. No, 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 for sure. Uh, but he's not the great libertarian hope. Like he, he's he's ethically, morally grotesque. He's not a good representative. I think that the effect on politics has been awful. I mean, you can't even you can't talk politics on. You never really could talk politics on social media. But people are so stupid at a level that I've never witnessed before. Yeah. Like, you go look at our Facebook page and, like, <laughs> trying to have a reasonable discussion with some of these people on net neutrality, like, you can say, please do not comment until you actually listen to this. Because Ajit Pai was on Matt Lewis, his podcast. Mm-hmm. He was also with the Reason folks, or the fifth column, one of the two, it's the same thing. Um, and, like, I, I learned a lot, and I was like, this people need to hear this. Like this is the other side that you're not hearing, mm-hmm. and it's pretty convincing. 
and it's just like, this page hates liberty, how could you call yourselves libertarian? It's like, you can't have a, a reasonable discussion on Facebook. Like, it's just, and, and Trump has kind of killed that, you know, and it, and it sucks, but... Yeah, it's top cack though, bruh. Top cack, yeah. And it's the other thing that's like this is liberty. Is like 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 we try to say it's like there's many paths to liberty, okay? And right, especially when it comes to net neutrality, dude. There's you're screwed either way. Let's let's save it because we're gonna talk about that after this next subject. Okay, all right. Oh wait, I'll fire. Put it back in the chamber. Yes, because talking about Elizabeth Warren, I've gotten several requests to talk about. Even before today, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the mm-hmm. CFPB. Um, so, this this is an interesting story. So let's talk about what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was. Okay, this bureau. You know, you have like these protection. You have these regulatory agencies for things like toasters. Mm-hmm. And so, a Harvard professor named Elizabeth Warren wrote a paper where she's basically like. You're going to regulate a $30 toaster, but nobody regulates financial products. Like, nobody regulates student loans or uh, payday lenders or mortgages or any of this stuff. Like, credit unions, who's actually out? Like, what is the agency that if you have a problem, you can go to that agency and they can deal with this issue? And so she, she, the year before the financial collapse in 2007, published this paper talking about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And uh, if you remember, the Dodd-Frank bill was passed in the wake of the reforms, Mm -hmm. and Barney Frank is from Massachusetts. He's from Boston. And so he had, he had, he knew Elizabeth Warren, he'd run into her, he'd read this paper, he liked the idea, and so he put it into the Dodd-Frank bill. And the creation was authorized by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, whose passage in 2010 was a legislative response to the financial crisis uh, and the subsequent Great Recession. Uh, It was established as an independent agency, but the status was being reviewed, is being reviewed by the U.S. Court of Appeals. (coughs) So, this is from Wikipedia, by the way. Um, According to former director Richard Cordray, uh, I always keep, I think keep thinking it's Rob Cordry from the, from uh, <laughs> the John Stewart days of the the good days mm-hmm. of the Daily Show. Mm, good. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry about the coughing, guys. The bureau's priorities are mortgages, credit cards, and student loans. Uh, it was designed to consolidate its employees and responsibilities from a number a number of other federal regulatory bodies, including the Federal Reserve, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, and the National Credit Union Administration, even the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. The Bureau is an independent unit located inside and funded by the U.S. Federal Reserve with an interim affiliation with the U.S. Treasury Department. So that's part of its independence is that it's not funded by politicians. It's funded by the Fed through overages of $20 trillion in debt, and we have overages at the Fed, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so it... It writes and enforces rules for financial institutions, um, and it examines both bank and non-bank institutions, monitors, and reports on markets. Uh, they started. You can basically write them and say, "I think I'm being ripped off by this person," and they will look into it for you. And <clears throat> you know, one of the criticisms is that, like Wells Fargo, mm-hmm. people started writing in about the Wells Fargo scandal, where you know, basically employees were writing in and saying, "There's an account open in my name. What's going on?" turned out that like this was this massive fraud scandal inside Wells Fargo and they didn't do anything about it. But we'll get more to more onto that later. So since the database was established in 2011, more than 7300 co- complaints have been published. Uh, CFPB detractors argue that it is a gotcha game. That's our, there's already a database maintained by the FTC, although that information is not available to the public. And in so the the issue of who leads the CFPB has been in contention from the beginning. So originally, Barack Obama had hired by this point by 2011, had hired Elizabeth Warren to work in the Treasury Department as a special advisor to the president, and she was kind of the de facto head of this agency before it really was implemented. But 
it was clear that Elizabeth Warren was not going to get confirmed by the Senate. That will come into play here. So, because the head of this agency is an executive agency, even though it is outside of the scope of Congress in some ways, Mm -hmm. it is not, it is still, you have to have the Senate approve whoever the appointment is. And this has been kind of an extra constitutional agency, and this has been the argument that Republicans have made from the very beginning, that there are things within this organization that aren't constitutional, that you can't just appoint, you can't create this agency that doesn't have oversight by Congress, that then has the ability to form regulations and punish American companies. Right. Like, there has to be some... You can't have a federal agency that isn't accountable to the president or to Congress. And the argument from the other side is, yes, there are oversights. Like, for instance, uh, the New York Times, which Adam Liptak is the New York Times has been the reporter on this. And, man, has he been in the tank for this. And I'll, I'll kind of point out the, the bias in some of his reporting. Um... You know, still the agencies, this is from, is the Consumer Bureau unaccountable and ineffective? New York Times writes, still the agency's financial independence from Congress is not the same as no oversight at all. Congress holds the Consumer Bureau accountable in several ways as outlined by the Consumer Federation of America. Its director must be confirmed by the Senate and is required to testify to the House and Senate committee twice a year. Big freaking whoop. Each year, that, that's my, that's the editor's note, it's not in the New York Times. <laughs> Each year, the Consumer Bureau is asked to submit reports to Congress and undergo an audit from the Government Accountability Office, an investigative agency in the legislative branch that has no power. The GAO has a podcast, and it's always funny, because they're like, we've discovered this corruption, and I'm like, nobody cares. So, it, it like, it, it, it is an extra-constitutional body. So, um, it, it also, like, the public publication of the complaints Mm -hmm. on a public website, you could argue is, is, is not necessarily fair, because it's kind of like the same thing where it's like, if you're a business and you're a payday loan person and you're dealing with a certain population, yeah. Um, and listen, I go to the pawn shop all the time. When I need an extra 200 bucks, I take something to the pawn shop. Because, man, that's cheap, easy cash. I always get it out. It's awful. Of course. But I'm bad with money. Um, but, no, like, something like the pawn shop. I've been in the pawn shop, okay? I'm just saying I'm down with my people. White trash, all right? Yeah, I, I see that. Right. Yeah. And the disdain in your voice that you just... You should have seen the look on his face. His pinky curled up. <laughs> His Perrier water, which isn't a koozie, so people don't realize it's Kroger brand, not Perrier. (laughs) So I'll not have you judging me. (laughs) Just saying, "Ah, that's an awful way to... Uh, It's it's very dumb. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes if you need an extra 200, it's better than going out and taking a a real loan. Well, you know, probably would just go down to like a truck stop. You'd probably make that 200 real quick. With my mouth? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm a lady, sir. I'm a lady. <laughs> but, so, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, when you're working with the dredge as a society, everyone out there that works with the general public knows that you know, these, sometimes these people call in for about anything. So, like, if you work, let's say, retail at a, I don't know, a gas station, people call on you just because they don't like you. Right. They're just tired of your stuff, or you won't let them have a free drink that day. Right. <laughs> so... Yeah, and so to publish it just outright, and on a, a federal government's website, some argue is it's undue influence. It's giving credibility to internet comments. Yeah, making Yelp federal. Right. <laughs> it's a federal <laughs> Yelp page. Exactly. So I'm going to give you two sides on the CFPB. Ooh. I'm going to give you the New York Times side, and then I'm going to give you the National Review side. Uh, because there's a writer named Ronald Rubin who has written some really good stuff, and Andrew McCarthy's a bright guy, um, that on economic stuff we would often agree with uh, the National Review as libertarians. So this is, like, you will real. so there's never been a moment in history where I've seen people 
at least in the last hundred years, distrust the press as much as they do right now, to the point that they're willing to bet on sending a child molester to the Senate. Because like ten years ago, you, child molesting's we're not cool with that. You got to go to jail. Like we're putting Jared in jail, mm-hmm. but we'll put more in the Senate. Like it's fine because we just just dis- distrust the Washington Post so much that we got to send this guy to the Senate. Well, they was. They actually had physical hardcore for proof with Jared and yeah. um, the other Let, news. Let's or- take a look at Roy's hard drives. Let's see what kind of U porn he's hitting up. YouTube just di- just got rid of like sixty five thousand YouTube accounts because they were, you know, up to no good on 6, YouTube. Sixty thousand accounts. It was like one hundred fifty thousand vi- one hundred fifty thousand videos. Yeah, it was ridiculous. And I am just guessing that you know, probably, never mind. Uh, but. And like the Washington Post, if you actually go read, if you actually, for the love of God, go read the story from the Washington Post about Project Veritas, instead of just seeing whatever your friends share, I've got it printed out, I didn't, no, we're not going to do it, because we were already way over time, like usual. It's like 9.30. I know, but, go. <sighs> am I bothering you? No, I'm no, just saying. <laughs> so... Go read it. And you, there were nine women that the Washington Post could have printed their names. They printed four. So mm-hmm. they did their journalistic duty. They're just, like, if you if you believe Roy Moore, you're wrong. Like, you're just, there's just no planet in which you could believe Roy Moore at this point. Like, you can sit there and say, like, you can be intellectually honest and say, yeah, he probably did that 40 years ago, but I don't want a Democrat in the Senate. And you could make that argument, but, like, you can't, at this point, really look into the Roy Moore situation and go, no, I don't believe the women. Like, I just don't, I don't see how you can intellectually get there. Well, then someone will say, like, well, the Democrats are pro-choice, and, you know, so that, that's killing babies. But so I'm going to uh, pick the lesser of two evils. Uh, picking the lesser of two evils is at least an argument. Mm-hmm. Like, just saying, I don't believe the press is not a valid argument. Correct, yeah, yeah. But the other thing is, like, um, they have the ability to, one, write in a libertarian. If you really don't want a Democrat to it, you can write in a libertarian. Yep. Or you can write in another Republican. I think his name's Ron Bishop. You're uh, saying the libertarian. The libertarian, good, yeah. Good, Doug good. Jones is the Democrat. Yeah, that's good. But, no, I mean, to, like, to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be voting for Roy Moore or Doug Jones anyways. But, you know, I just I think if you actually use your brain and use critical thinking instead of engaging in fi- pointless Facebook fights... Mm-hmm. I just don't see how you can, like, look at any of this Roy Moore stuff and not go, yeah, this guy was a freaking creep. Yeah, and if anything, you can look at stuff like this and understand that why there need to be more choices on ballots and ballot, and better ballot access for other, uh, for other political parties. Because you could you could get stuck with um, um, <laughs> the freaking Discord. Um, you could get stuck with just someone on the, on the ballot just because, like, well, these are the ballot access rules. Yeah. You know, because, like, you know, what if something, if they find something about the Democrats, so you've got, let's say, like, someone like a heart, you know, they're both, let's say they're both pedos. You know, right. not saying the other one is, I'm just a hypothetical lecture, right. but since, because the ballot's the way it is, well, you can pick from pedo B or pedo A. Right. You know? It's like, it's like, and the people who try to make the moral equivalency of Al Franken to, like, like the, the whataboutism of, well, uh, well, what about Al Franken? Well, what about Al Franken? Like he's wrong too. Like, the, the, yeah. like, what about Al Franken or what about Conyers? That isn't an argument for Roy Moore. Like, right. that's that's a logical fallacy called two quo co. Is that what it is? How dare you? <laughs> you know your logical fallacies. Yeah, something like that. I can't. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically it's. But it's just Google what about ism and you'll find it. But. I mean, it's a logical fallacy to say it's that just that kindergarten thinking. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like that's fine, and it's, it's and if the Democrats are dealing with that, and that's dealing with that this camp, but we're talking right. about that's irrelevant at this point. We're talking about this one camp. Your evidence that you're bringing up is irrelevant. Right. Like I'm just at the point where like if you if I post about Roy Moore and you bring up Al Franken. I'm, I just have to block you at yeah. this point. Yeah. It's like you're too stupid to be my Facebook friend. Mm-hmm. Dolphin swim. <laughs> right. Okay. Why'd you bring that up? Why'd you bring up Al Franken? <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, good, because I've got, we'll start another thread over here about Al Franken. We'll talk about that over there, but over here, right here, we'll talk about this. I, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I'm, I don't like the left or the right. Yep. I'm different. Yeah. So anyways, uh, so the New York Times battle for control of consumers agency heads to court. 
So the part about this that I missed, that I should have read, that's really important, mm -hmm. is uh, is basically that uh, forget the facts. I can remember. There you go. Basically, in 2012, they wouldn't they wouldn't give a hearing to Rob Cordry, and they kept because the Republicans were like, "This is not a constitutional agency. We're not going to implement this." And there was a Republican Senate, and they just would not. They filibustered the actual hearing, mm -hmm. and they just said no. We're not, we're not even going to entertain your choice. And so during a uh, recess, he did a recess appointment. Mm -hmm. And he also did a recess appointment at the same time to uh, basically, it, it's like, a, you know, back when the Constitution was written and they were gone for six months, the president was given the power of the recess appointment, which, you know, Congress won't be back for six months. We need a postmaster general. Right. And, and the federal government was the size of, you know, you could fit it in my apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the recess appointment was for. The recess appointment now is not to be used to appoint the head of a major federal agency. The, you know, Elizabeth Warren wrote this agency with, uh, you know, to have a member body that guided it. And the Senate, the Democratic Senate and the Democratic president, then whittled it down to a single person ruled the agency. And so Barack Obama just appointed him. And at the same time, he appointed uh, several members to the National Travel Advisory Board or something, Transit Board, I think mm -hmm. it was, Transit, actually. Um, and those got challenged under the constitutionality of those appointments. So that threw in Cordry's actions into constitutional, you know, all of this, all of this stuff that we're talking about tonight in this, sec in this part is all dealing with Barack Obama's wild over-interpretation of the Constitution and going way past the Constitution in, in so many different ways, be it these appointments here, creating an agency that, and signing off on an agency and promoting an agency that doesn't fit within the parameters of executive power within the Constitution as the courts have ruled over 200 years, or net neutrality, where he basically just did something that the Congress should have done in the first place, which we'll get to. So all of what is going on right now are, is the Republicans checking the power of the previous administration, which is exactly what all of us said at the time. Yeah, you can do this, but what happens when your guy's not in power? Well, their guy's not in power anymore, and now it's all being reversed. Mm -hmm. so, so he appointed this Cordry guy and uh, in 2012. So... Uh, the New York Times writes, it encapsulates the dueling visions of how the American financial system could be regulated as President Trump moves to loosen regulation created under the Obama administration to reign in the financial industry. Leander, Leandra English, the deputy director of the Bureau, who was set to become its temporary chief, filed a lawsuit late Sunday night to block Mr. Trump's choice of someone else from taking control of the agency on Monday morning. Leanna English was one of the original staff members, and uh, she was appointed to be deputy director. And I do believe, like that, it has to be an appointed position too by the Senate. I may be wrong about that, but um, her appointment to that deputy director position was controversial as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump has been seeking to install his budget director Mick Mulvaney as the agency's acting director. The bureau had been a quote unquote total disaster and needed a new leadership to bring it back to life, Mr. Trump has said on Twitter. Mr. Mulvaney has been openly hostile to the Consumer Bureau, calling it a sad, sick joke, and supporting legislation to eliminate it. At stake is the immediate future of the Consumer Bureau, once one of the last holdouts within the federal government against Mr. Trump's efforts to strip away business regulations. While Mr. Trump can appoint his own director... Confirmation could take months and slow down Republican efforts to defang the agency. This dispute has elevated Ms. English to a national spotlight. Before, before her appointment, she was a low-profile career civil servant who joined the agency. And then it goes on to talk about how she went to the London School of Economics and she's so qualified. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created six years ago um, under the leadership of Richard Cordray, 
the departing director, the Bureau aggressively used its power to develop new rules and punish companies that broke the existing ones. It targeted abusive debt collectors and bolstered protections for mortgage brokers. Under Mr. Cordray, it won nearly $12 billion in refunds and canceled debts for 29 million consumers. But that put it in the crosshairs of the industry critics and many Republicans. Um, Wall Street hates it like the devil hates holy water, said Dick Durbin, the Democrat from Illinois. Um, so, you know, to protect the agency from political interference, Congress gave it unusual independence and autonomy. The Bureau's leader, who serves a five-year term, is one of the few federal officials the president cannot fire at will. Beautiful writing. Yeah. It's like something I would write about me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so like, I read that after I read the next article I will read you. Okay. So it kind of tainted my view. But, like, just if you read the New York Times only, mm -hmm. you go, well, wow, okay, this agency, like, who's, against, beautiful. who's yeah. against consumer protection, Harry? Right, you know. No one loves credit more than you. Mm -hmm. Credit, that credit score, you love it. I love my credit score. And you don't want anybody messing with it. Nobody. And you want it protected. Mm -hmm. How could you be against that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And people need the protections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, it, it, it's, even the name, it's hard to argue against that. Mm-hmm. It's so right in the name. It's in the name. It's, they're protecting us. The yeah. government is making me feel so good. They've got science in the name. Yeah, they're going after those evil Wall Street banksters. Yeah, that's all they're doing, I and swear. And the mean Republicans just keep going after them and trying to deregulate everything. Mm -hmm. So rude. So so you, what you essentially have is... And Obama would have to do with this if the Republicans would stop blocking him. Right. And do all these tricks. So this Rob Cordray is a guy who's going back to run in Ohio for governor. He's apparently, like, he's one of us. He's very awkward socially. Yeah. And has no shot. But he lost the attorney general's race in Ohio, went to do this. Now he's going back to run for governor because he saved everyone $12 billion. And, uh, and so he resigned. And then he appointed... After Mick Mulvaney was appointed, who is the current OMB head, mm -hmm. Mick Mulvaney was in Congress. He was on the Financial Services Committee. He hated this. He went after it all the time. Like Rob Corder was like, he's gonna gut it. This is awful. We gotta, I gotta do something. So, in a political stunt, basically to get everybody like us talking about him, he, he the president, who was head of the executive branch, appointed Mick Mulvaney. He, the director, appointed Leanne English. So. Two people showed up for work today. Yes. Well, on Monday, actually. Like, that doesn't really work. So, you know, Andrew McCarthy writes, Trump's in the right in the CFPB tiff. Like, what we always have to remember is, yes, Trump is president, and we don't, like, Trump does things that aren't good, like, say racially charged things like Pocahontas mm -hmm. to American heroes that are Native Americans, but he's also the president. And so sometimes he's going to do things that the president should do that is right. Right. And uh, so some legal questions are tough, uh, Andrew McCarthy writes. The question of who should lawfully be considered the acting director of the CFPB is not one of them. President Trump unquestionably has the power to name Mick Mulvaney, his Senate-confirmed budget director, to the position, and he has done so. The lawsuit seeking to block his appointment filed by the deputy director, Leandra English. She filed a suit saying, hey, I should have the job. Who hopes to take the job herself is frivolous and offensive. Mm -hmm. CFPB is an unconstitutional monstrosity that ought to be abolished. Indeed, the current TIF is but a symptom of the underlying disease. The political progressives who created the CFPB sought to make it a quote-unquote independent agency beyond political accountability and interbranch checks and balances. It would be a boon if the dust-up over the acting leadership of the agency would spur the cause that would invalidate the entire enterprise. So, I mean, it's it just, the, the idea that the president doesn't have the constitutional authority to appoint a vacancy... Mm -hmm. Is laughable. Is laughable. Yeah, it's laughable. And the whole like, quote in the New York Times that article that quote that it's a he called it a sad sick joke. It's taken out of context and there's a comma in there and it was like the whole sentence was like no it didn't end the sentence didn't work that way. Exactly right. You know he was calling it sick and then it's all sad and they just kind of just boom, jumped it all together called exactly. sad sick joke. Uh, and tonight before we started the program, Judge Tim Kelly of the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia 
refused to grant Leandra English a restraining order to bar Mulvaney from serving as the acting director. The ruling from Kelly, quote-unquote, well, a, a, comma, a Trump appointee, clears the way for Mulvaney to run the CFPB until a permanent director is sworn in or English successfully appeals the decision. Now, here's the other side of the agency. This is by Ronald Rubin. Richard Cordray delivers the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau punchline. Richard Rubin has been really good on writing about this and a lot of great articles that gave me a lot of good context on this. Uh, at National Review, and this is a little bit about Cordray. Ambitious, cerebral, and socially awkward, Cordray had alternated between stints as an accomplished lawyer and a mediocre politician before he lost Ohio's attorney general election in 2010, and Elizabeth Warren, then a presidential assistant, hired him to lead the nascent bureau's enforcement division. The following July, President Obama bypassed Warren and instead nominated Cordray to be the CFPB's first director. In the Marathon standoff that ensued, Republican senators filibustered the nomination. Obama installed Cordray by using an unconstitutional recess appointment. Democrats threatened to change the filibuster rules, and Republicans surrendered. On July 16, 2013, the Senate confirmed the temporary director to a five-year term. Since 2010, the Republicans have argued that the CFPB's unique structure, an independent agency whose single director the president can only fire for cause, with guaranteed funding through the Federal Reserve, profits rather than congressional appropriation process, is a recipe for government abuse, if not unconstitutional. Cordray proved them right. Basically, Warren built a political battleship. Cordray deployed it. The Bureau's powerful media division dictated policy to its regulatory professionals relentlessly, exaggerated the agency's achievements in daily press releases and on social media posts. Political operatives used the CFPB's super-independence to stonewall congressional subpoenas, and hide unethical investigation tactics, internal discrimination problems, and other inconvenient facts. Republican critics were dismissed as Wall Street sycophants. In fact, Cordray spent the first half of this year quietly promoting and entrenching faithful Democratic employees to res- obstruct his Republican, Republican successor. On June 30th, he awarded the GMMB an additional $15 million contract. Um... I'm trying to look and see where, what the GMMB, I think it's a, yeah. Um, on June 30th, he, uh, 10 days later, he delivered a gift bag to Democratic donors in the plaintiff's bar, a rule banning financial businesses from using contractual arbitration clauses to prevent consumers from joining class action lawsuits. Cordray argued that the lawsuits were unnecessary to prevent deceptive practices because individuals rarely sue over improper bank fees and other small damages. Of course, the CFPB was created to prosecute such violations, but he said that limited resources prevented it from sufficiently taking actions. He then unveiled a video uh, about it, an expensive uh, creation reminiscent of Clinton's Stronger Together ads, and Republicans were forced to use Congressional Review Act to block the rule. Uh, Democrats, as a result, gained a talking point for the midterm elections. Um, Then he basically gave a, a gimme to uh, payday loan lenders and let them survive even after Democrats. One of the reasons that they wanted this created was to get rid of payday loans. Um, but Cordray had a big problem. President Trump was expected to use the Federal Vacancies Reform Act of 1998 to appoint Mulvaney. Um, actually, he, uh, he announced the rule on November 15th. He announced he would resign by the end of the month. He had a big problem. Trump was going to put in Mulvaney, a fam- former member of the House, and who criticized the CFPB. And Cordray feared that Mulvaney would discover evidence the CFPB had been hiding for years, including the Bureau's failure to investigate the Wells Fargo fraud, data manipulation and its failed attempt to regulate car dealers by guessing buyers' races and alleging discriminor- discriminatory lending, Inspector General admonishments to stop obstructing congressional oversight, and some particularly explosive sexual harassment claims against CFPB senior managers. So he put in Leander English as a last-ditch effort to hopefully cover all this up, Mm -hmm. because he knew that once Mulvaney got in there, he would be in deep shit. Yeah, things couldn't be covered up. You needed someone in the power that you could trust to, like, hey, tell Bert to get rid of that. Yeah, (laughs) exactly right. So that is what the C... So when you, like go, oh, this is just a Democratic, like, they, they, 
No, like they just beat filled stick. it with Democrats, yeah, mm-hmm. to beat Wall Street, yeah. and then use it for, like they went after, they didn't go after Wells Fargo, which don- donates to Democrats. They went after Mer- Merrill Lynch, that donates to Republicans. Yep. So that twelve billion dollars, if you really look at who those, the, the people that donated, mm-hmm. to Republicans, those were the ones who got regulated, not the ones that donated to Democrats. Yeah, and, and they attacked small banks. Yep. So that's why there's like a lot of those little tiny little mom and pop banks are gone, but like a lot of the chain franchise payday loans out, the more predatory ones are still around, yep. but the smaller ones are gone. Right. Yeah. And uh, granted, like some people like the payday <laughs> loans places, they they suck and they're freaking traps. But a lot of people who use them, they need that cash flow. Yeah. You know they, or they just need access to just cheap credit, the easy credit. Yeah. I mean, people who use payday loans can't get loans anywhere else. Yeah. It's the only way they can get it. I can't even get a loan at a payday loan, but that's why I have to go to the pawn shop. I, like even the the. Have you ever seen the Western Sky ads for like Western Sky Credit? No. Yeah. It's like an eight hundred and seventy five percent rate. <laughs> it's, it's like like you get a loan for a thousand dollars and you pay eight thousand dollars. I mean, it's there's some real shady stuff out there. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, but if you just like use your brain and like instead of going, oh, I need a thousand dollars right now because I want it, mm-hmm. and um, then you look at it and you go, oh, this will cost me three thousand dollars to borrow. Yeah. Or you see some people's with their car, like these car loans at twenty five percent interest. Yeah. And I look at them as like twenty five percent interest. Yeah. I could buy your car. You can give me six percent interest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk after the show. <laughs> so, in, in my mind, the CFPB is it, it good riddance. Like it, it's it's government regulation, and it and it's it's well, good. It's well intentioned. It's like yeah. everything else. It's well intentioned, but it doesn't deserve to exist. Right, and it, and what it, it was what it was trying to do is it did some stupid stuff. Like uh, it helps out. It was supposed to help out people to like. Get, make sure they got advance notice if you had an adjustable rate mortgage. Well, if you're dumb enough to get an adjustable rate mortgage... Explain what that is. Adjustable rate mortgage, like most people have a mortgage that it's at a flat rate, so when you got it in, it's at this rate, at this percentage interest rate, and it's always it's going to be at that rate. So most people would go like, well, my mortgage payments is 1200 a month, you know, and it will always be that judging, jumping up for taxes once, uh, once in a while. With an adjustable rate mortgage is that interest rate on your mortgage if the, um, the, the, the price where that... Uh, wherever the Fed puts the interest rate at, your mortgage payment will jump up and down with that. So if it goes really, really low down to 1%, hey, you're going to pay 1%. But right. if that thing jacks up to 12 guess what just got jacked up? Your interest rate. So and, a a, lot, and a lot of people got killed in the in the crisis in 2008 with arms. Because mm-hmm. they saw that as a cool idea. It can keep going lower. You know, just people who just don't understand math. <laughs> you know, or like, well, the, the other thing is like people's like, well, I got it at 4 You know, what if it dropped? Yeah, but what if it goes to eight? You know, at the same time, it's like because if it, you know, if it drops down, refi. If it goes up, woo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God I locked it in at four. Uh, so that's a good. So I can see that. Uh, the other thing it does, that it tries to help people out who are into foreclosure, which was huge around that time because of the housing crisis. Right. But the thing is, they put so many different protections in it that I mean you can possibly stay at a house and not pay the mortgage on the thing for about two years uh-huh. because like, you have to wait to get in foreclosure. Then you've got 120 days after that, right? So you you could possibly play the game and just kind of stay in a house for a while. Yeah. And squat. You know. But, that's what but, I do. <laughs> All right, so the uh, yeah, um, let's see what else they um, they um, the mortgage service helps send out clear monthly statements, so the detailing because like that's all the good things. Is like um, most people don't know how to read like the mortgage payment and statement. Right. Um, I remember when we first got the house and um, um, one of my wife would bring me the mortgage statement. I was you know showing her the credit, uh, pop into the computer and try to show her, and she's like, "Well, I put extra in there." And I was showing you in the in the in the weird. Uh, small print payment section, they said you would have to pay so much off per month before they have an attack of the principal if you just paid in the regular processing sheet. You had to, in order to hit principal from just paying off, you have to send in a separate check that says put on principal. Oh. So if you say, so if your mortgage, was, so, the, so if our mortgage was, was $1,200 a month and I just sent them four two hundred. <laughs> They would just tag that extra two hundred onto next month's payment, not the principal. Mm. You would have to send a separate check just for principal. 
Right. Yeah. And if you hadn't actually read that... Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, you just screw yourself over. Right. You just keep getting ahead, 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 ahead. It's the same thing as, like, like um, you know, that's how I paid off cars so fast. It's like, because, like, you know, you find out, like, okay, so what's my payoff amount? It's this month? Okay. Which, you know, I need a tech principal. How do I do that? You know? Mm, um, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, you, and it's the best thing to go when you go to a bank. It's like, okay, I see that. How do I attack the principal? I want to pay the principal now. So, so you're, so let's say you pay off a thousand dollars on the principal. Does that then lower the amount of interest you're ultimately going to pay? Like, mm -hmm. so like if I'm paying, let's say five hundred dollars a month for a car payment, uh -huh. and four hundred is the principal and a hundred is the interest, just for math's sake, and and probably the other way, right? <laughs> right. So, so you're gonna you're gonna pay less over time by paying on the principal. Getting okay. that down because okay. the interest payment is calculated for compound interest through the year of your term. Oh, okay. So it's calculated based on like the amount you owe and you owe, and the principal just calculated over your we'll year. We'll title this segment Harry Teaches Spangle How to Be an Adult. <laughs> so you just, yeah, like I said, like it, and you just got to learn how to take that out because if the principal starts going down, then that interest that they want to charge, that's not there. Right. And, you know, and if you pay too much, you get a check, actually. So, Interesting. Nice. Yes. 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 So what else did they do? That was like the, uh, uh, let's see, the services outside, uh, they have to <coughs> credit your payments the day they get them. So let's say uh, they made sure, so they, if you, let's say you were overdrafting in your account or you owed something, the moment they received it is the day they have to pay for it. So if mm. you had to, they set up that up so... Let's say, let's, let's beat on Wells Fargo. Wells, uh, you owe Wells Fargo on Friday, and your check gets there on Friday. Let's say they don't, no, we're not going to process it Monday and want to charge you late fees for that whole weekend, which is scummy. Right. Um, you know, it kind of protects you from that and forcing them to, like, no, that, you know, that check needs to clear on Friday because that's when it's got there. Sure. Uh, and you're just like, well, we need regulations like that. Yeah, but or if, you know, the CFP wasn't going after small banks and well, we had more small credit unions in the area, crap like that wouldn't happen. Sure. You know, so. Yeah, like I, I have a, a friend who used to be a stock trader, and we were talking about the stock. We were talking about Bitcoin today, actually. <laughs> uh, by the way, Michael Arrington, founder of TechCrunch, who is a, kind of a crazy person but also very influential, is starting a Bitcoin hedge fund. Ooh. So I wish I had ten thousand dollars to buy a Bitcoin because now that there's going to and there's multiple hedge funds that are starting to get into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would love to be Ian right now <laughs> over at Free Talk Live. <laughs> I wish I had listened to Roger three years ago and set up the Bitcoin. Like the the listeners who said, "How can I donate in Bitcoin?" and I said, "I don't understand it. I'm not going to do it." I'm sorry. I'd like to apologize. I'm a dummy. It's at ten thousand now, and now that hedge funds are getting in, I'll never be able to afford it again. So, uh, my you know, wife just got a new phone, and I left <coughs> some Bitcoin on her wallet for like from Porkfest for a while back. Totally forgot about it. Six hundred dollars just sitting on there. Nice. <laughs> it's like whoa, oh. I was like transferring. It. I was yeah. like, let me go, girl. God, I forgot about this. She had like a little. I don't know. She she's she just like I don't remember how much I left on there. It's not much. Yeah, <laughs> that was much. like, but that was years ago when she used it. <laughs> Nuts, it was crazy. But what we were talking about, so like, he was talking about how he was a stockbroker during the Silicon Valley crash in the late '90s, and he's, he's like, you know, I I, I was dealing with clients who were losing, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars in thirty seconds because the trade wouldn't clear fast enough. So I asked, who who buys? Mm -hmm. Because here's the here's the the screwed up thing is. If you're dealing with like a Chase or a Merrill Lynch or whatever, uh, and they have a they have a buy rating on it, mm -hmm. and then you go to like Moody's or Standards and Poor's and it says hold, mm -hmm. like that means that they know it's about to go down, and so they're trying to dump their stock that Merrill Lynch owns onto the Merrill Lynch clients, so <laughs> they don't take a bath on it. You know, okay. so they make money both ways. They get you coming and going. He's like. I just couldn't do it because it was just that you, you were ripping people off and you knew it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. speaking of... Uh, but there's other ways to get the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is not the only thing on the news. And and the thing is, is you know, um, 
Bitcoin is going to continue going up. It's still cheap. Buy what you can. Buy what you're also, if you want to get in, it's buy what you're ready to lose also. Uh, because at the same token, a lot of people, so you see all these people that made all this money, they also could have lost their shirts. Oh, I remember, I mean, Bitcoin, like, because we've been following it forever, just because we're in the libertarian movement. I mean, there was a time where people were freaking out because Bitcoin hit a thousand. I remember that. And, and then it just, like, it tanked. You know, so it's, it's, but if you have hedge fund speculators, because here's the thing, libertarians have kind of bankrolled in a lot of ways the backbone of Bitcoin, and they view it as currency, mm-hmm. and what you're getting now, this inflation, are people who consider it an investment, and that's a very different mindset. Yep. And so, uh, you, if you're looking at it as an investment, it's something that you will flee when it starts to crash, mm-hmm. you know, if you look at it as a currency, then you're you're going to keep what you've got and and use it over time. So, I, I don't know. I think it's it's two different philosophy shifts, and I'll be interested to see how the entrance into Bitcoin from traditional financial entities and and uh, and people outside of kind of the tech space that get it, kind of the libertarian tech space that kind of has been around mm-hmm. Bitcoin. I'll be interested to see what happens as "Quote unquote normies get into it." Yeah, and back up your wallet. That dot. That wallet dot. What dot? That wallet dot. dot. <laughs> Gotta make, keep messing this up. That dot dot dat file. The wallet dot dat file. Make sure you guys back up your wallets. How do you Be- do that? Um, basically, it's just a. With Air, if you've got an Airbits wallet, it backs up for you. You just got to pull the file off your phone and put it on something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you've got Airbits through Chrome, or um, I say Airbits a bunch because it's such an easy wallet to use. Okay. It's my favorite wallet I use to move cash around with. Not a wallet I use because it, it, it's easy to encrypt, easy to move wall, different wallets and move things through it. But the best is you just the thing, you, it's a file because it's this basic electronic file mm-hmm. on your phone. You've got to back that up and make sure you keep your username and your password because, you know, one, you know, you lose your phone and everything. And you've got your dat file. You can get your wallet back and get your cash, you know, re- right. re- recover your thing and get your cash back because it is like cash. That's the sucky thing about it. And uh-huh. and once you put bitcoins on your phone, make sure you <clears throat> put encryption on your phone because if someone steals your phone, if there's no encryption, I just gotta go smiley face and it unlocks your phone and you know, now it's like, Oh crap, there's a Bitcoin wallet on there. Oh it, it's it's just using pins. It's just four <laughs> numbers. Beep, 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 beep. Got it, thank you. I've got your pin now. Right. Now I'm in your Bitcoin. Scan it, it's done, it's gone. No FDIC insurance is gone. So well well less still. So you know, so if you do put bitcoins on your phone, your laptop, make sure that even to access that drive, even that backup file is encrypted. Someone has to go through another file to get through it. Make sure you write down your passcodes because uh, people with powerful computers or just like people who like hack passwords, you know, they're not hacking passwords maliciously to get into people's computers anymore. Now they're doing it for bitcoin wallets and making a lot of money doing it. Mm. You know, they're just like, you know, whatever I get out, I get 60%. <laughs> uh, and you may say that's outrageous. It's like, all right, here you go. Here's your brick. It means nothing to you. Yeah. You know, and with it, ten thousand. You know, like screw it. Take sixty percent. I don't care. <laughs> you get it done in the day. Take sixty-five. <laughs> yeah, you'll need that net neutrality to protect you from. Uh, from ah. <laughs> uh, so, so I haven't. Uh, I mean, I really dived in to net neutrality over the weekend. No pee on this one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Where are you going? Oh, no. Oh. I, I don't want to get too deep into it tonight. I mainly want to give you a chance to, because you, you said, listen, can we talk about, i got things to say, All but right, let me pee. You, you go ahead and pee, but uh, people are freaking out. <laughs> like, it, it's, it, and I posted about it a few times and, and had some, actually some pretty thoughtful discussions about net neutrality on the Facebook page um, at uh, We Are Libertarians with several people, and a lot of people brought up some really interesting points, both pro and negative. Um, he, he, and it's... And we're going to do a full episode again, because I feel like we haven't really kind of dove into this enough, because what's out there is really hyperbolic. And John C. Dvorak wrote an article in PC World that uh, basically was like, why is everybody freaking out? Everybody calm down. 
You know, the internet is going back to 2015. The internet was really good from 1988 to 2015. Um, and it just does seem to me that people are being very dramatic, especially on the anti-Ajit Pai side, you know, the, the, the people who are upset about what the FCC will do next month. They're very dramatic, and they're very, they're freaking out. And it's just, to me, is... I don't know. Is is the freaking out by the? It's it's like not by everyone. Yeah, like it's it's not pro net. Everybody is pro net neutrality. Like that's the thing about this. Nobody. I think everybody and we're really at a point where everybody agrees. Yes, the internet should be free and open, mm-hmm. and it should stay that way. Like even people who are in the government, like. That's what Ajit Pai says. Mm-hmm. That's what the other FCC people are on the other side of it. Like, people on both sides of this issue, all of them agree, the Internet should stay free and open. So it's just how do we best do that to structure this in the government to make sure that it never gets regulated? But the Internet is not free and open. Okay. Um, the minority of the people talking about it, like the ISPs, they you know they get crapped on, but mm-hmm. they're the people who have to. Now, granted, they're not anyway any like type of savior in any of this crap. Sure. Because they've been caught, you know, with their heads, you know, their hands red handed, like doing this to stupid, uh, doing this to companies. Yeah, I mean, net That's neutrality why... was started because an internet company blocked V in two thousand five. Vonage mm-hmm. from their service, and that's when it really got started. It was like really brought up because somebody was a bad actor and started this. But like after twelve mm-hmm. years of arguing over net neutrality, like it's so clear from a consumer standpoint that we don't want this. That Comcast feels the need to tweet out that they're not going to do it. Like at some point, like I just feel like people on that side. It's it's hard for me to really buy into it because so many of the people arguing from that side had a bad customer experience with Comcast or AT&T, and that is the, really the basis of their emotional argument. Well, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, well, it's so bad because <laughs> Melody lived and bastardized by AT&T, Comcast, Time Warner, Bright House, what, you name it, because these ISPs have such gigantic minor, uh, not minorities, but monopolies in each area, so that you have to deal with them, and there's nowhere else to go to. Right. That's the other reason, too. It's like... And they won't compete with each other. You know, they won't go. And they, it's like OPEC, but for bandwidth. Right. And uh, just, it, 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 it's a crazy. And, and, and what, the way that some people are freaking out. And, and, and my same thing is, I always said, is like, if they can, they will. They, you know, if they aren't already. You know, because you have no proof they're not really throttling things right now. Sure. And they're uh, and the cloud fat. Look how slow it took them to get what gigabyte speed everywhere around the cross country. But uh, uh, allow me to stick up for the ISPs. Like, if if you and, and I'm not nearly as knowledgeable on this. That's why I, I'm like I'm trying to catch up on all of it to make sure that I represent all the arguments and and come down on it in a, in a way that I think is m- the best for liberty. But like, if you look at the progress over the last fifteen years in mm-hmm. terms of bandwidth, with the exception of my apartment complex. <laughs> but, but, like, I'm having to use a hotspot mm-hmm. to stream the video. Like, w- the service has really... It, 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 it's 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 hard to build an, an infrastructure, right? Like, it's hard to build that many lines a- and in that many places and then continually upgrade it on a brand new technology that's constantly being redeveloped, like, that's a hard task. And I think if you're sitting there as the CEO of Comcast, Bright House, AT&T, trying to figure out how to continually upgrade service, I just don't think that Comcast and AT&T sit there and think, how can I screw them out of their internet today? Like, I think uh, AT&T does that. <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, it's... <laughs> N-E-A... Um. <laughs> and, and nobody hates AT and T more than me. I literally think they're the worst company on the planet. Like I have them for my phone. I have them for my internet. Like I have it, it's it's awful. The octopus that is AT and T is terrible. But it it can't be easy to like have millions of homes 
across and maybe these the, the problem really is like these companies are too big trying to do too much mm-hmm. and the so problem. they and, and and they don't allow competition to come in and Correct. they buy off local governments yep. that to me seems to be the real problem that we ought to be fighting not how can we get the federal government to regulate this under title 1 or title 2 right. like that shouldn't be the libertarian argument in my opinion mm-hmm. like Please email me at editor at com if you think I'm wrong, because I want to hear both sides of this issue, because I see libertarians that I respect on both sides of the issue, and so I want to, like, I just want to hear, uh, like, but I just don't, I look, I, I'm coming down on the side of uh, Ajit Pai, because I, I see the other side really arguing hypotheticals, as opposed to, like, giving me facts of, this is really what these companies have done wrong, this is where, you know, I, I just don't see the federal communications. Like, I work in an industry that is a free speech. So if I wanted to, like, if I wanted to go on, this is completely free speech. I can say fuck here. Okay? <laughs> like, I can say cunt. Whoa, 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 whoa. But if you were on the radio, you would have heard that the way that it was, which is bleeped. Because <laughs> I'll go back and bleep that. Because I promise not to say that word anymore, but can't understand normal thinker. I know, I know. Normies, they're ruining America. But uh, no, like it's, I I can't go on and say whatever I want on radio, which is regulated by the FCC. Mm-hmm. So I just don't buy that the FCC is going to be the great protector of our free speech. You know. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is like the a lot of the companies like are because it's. The ISPs are a minority, actually, in all this, <laughs> seeking redress from the government. You go after the, the group, but they're the only a minority because they paid the government to make sure they were the only companies that went that went for it. Right. You know? So you know, so um, you know, people in the chat are talking about yeah, because like Net, um, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all these larger video companies, they are, they eat up most of the bandwidth on the internet. That's that's no Harry's no tales, especially when it starts getting to four, if they want to get into four K streaming, right? They're going to eat up bandwidth, you yeah. Know? And they treat each packet the same. That's going to be awful. First off, I would prefer if the um, I think the libertarian position is creating more, it's trying to get low clubs to create more internet um, ISPs. That'd yeah. be great. The other um, libertarian position, which should be the ISP, should know what my traffic is. How about that? You have no idea what I'm sending. How about that? That's actually a great idea. That's a better thing to me. I don't want you to know. Yeah. I, no, you just know I have traffic. I have bandwidth. Why do you need to know I'm going to Netflix? Harry wants all packets treated equally. Um, all packets you don't know. Agnostic packets. We had to do that back in, like, okay, back in the, um, let's see, the 2000, and try to remember... Well, no, 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 way back machine. You used to be do the hotspots, right, and you give you unlimited access to the internet and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. But if you did anything else like streaming or anything else, they would throttle you on your Wi-Fi connect on your hotspot connection. Right. You could use a VPN, tunnel into a VPN server, right? Have your high speed connection there, and you could do anything you want on their same unlimited connection, because they couldn't tell what the heck you were doing on your freaking hotspot. Mm. Beautiful, it was beautiful, beautiful time. You know? Yeah. It's a great time for the internet. Heck yeah. E- equal packets. Well, yeah, because they couldn't tell what you were doing. They just like, okay, he's doing VPN traffic to the server, and the ser- I mean, the server that was connected somewhere else, that one, you know, to the hard line that was going out on the net, pulling things out. Right. You know? It's, I what if I don't want my ISP to know what I'm doing? That's that's to me. <laughs> I don't want my ISP to know what my packets are. I don't want them to. I prefer now. Granted, that would entail creating more ISPs. You know, or and so I can get the ISP that I want, the ISP that like you know just agnostic. Nope, you just surf. We don't look. We don't keep any logs. You know, just surf. You know, right. That's the that's the better you know libertarian position that allows to safeguards for people. One down uh, to like whistleblowers because hey, if they don't know what they're doing online. They can easily get you know get stuff out there. Uh-huh. When the other thing with it goes to it, like this whole like the agnostic idea. Is because Motherboard dot com did an article about cryptocurrencies because this whole throttling aspect that works the same way. Hey, what's your favorite internet cryptocurrency? It uses the internet protocol. Which this article, oh man, I think I I, I got banned from like one Bitcoin group because <laughs> I kept going like I told you freaking so. I told you so. You have 
Bitcoin is awesome. It uses the internet, but at the same time, if you control the internet, you can stop. You can kind of screw with Bitcoin. Right. You can't stop it, but you can freaking screw with it. I can make it almost virtually unusable. That's kind of why I've I've not really cared much about cryptocurrency because it's like I don't know. It's it's as make believe as fiat currency. <laughs> Well, you know? it's a little bit more hardline than that because you you know if some people are doing work for it, but it is but it's about the same way you know it's it's yeah. It's, well, I just triggered somebody. Yeah. Somebody just got real triggered. Yeah, probably there's somebody in the somebody's real triggered. I mean, find, the internet is a to series find that of motherboard article I put in the trailer, but I can't see it. I'm sure Spangle must have covered up my motherboard.com article. It's, I'm guessing memes. In in the meantime, it's I'm, I'm going to assume. That's a, for that's a 2006 classic. This is uh, uh, Senator Stevens from back in 2006. Painfully trying to explain net neutrality on the Senate floor. the people <laughs> like I want to say hey these, these are the people we should have a constitutional amendment that will uh, guarantee internet freedom but like these are the people that would be writing that yeah well It's talking about Netflix. Yeah. Which it, it's... <laughs> I think I can't take this anymore. It's... All right. Okay. All right. You know, it's getting to the good part. <laughs> Harry's so triggered. Can't take it. Yeah, so basically he was arguing for net neutrality by using Netflix in 2006, which if he's saying there's this company that delivers movies via the mail, and now they're trying to clog up the tubes with streaming movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just amazing. Like, you think about how much has changed in 10 years, like how much we depend on, like it's like Netflix is 25% of the internet traffic. Easily. Yeah, I mean, really. Easily. And Amazon Video, and let's see, there's YouTube, everything, right. yeah. And, and that's a lot of it. Like, that's, I kind of want to know what side those companies are on, and then I want to go, I'm on the opposite side of those companies, because those companies don't want to pay for, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just still un, up in the air on it, but I'm just not seeing very effective arguments that are real arguments. I'm just seeing a lot of bitching and hyperbole from the people who are freaking out over... Ajit Pai taking the internet back to 2015, and and he made that he there was a great podcast that he did with Matt Lewis, the Matt Lewis podcast, where he did an interview with him, and he was like, 
the infrastructure development has slowed 5% in the last two years because they have to go to the FCC and get clearance. Right. So, to do anything. Right. Well, that's the other problem. Like, the FCC has held back communications since its inception. Okay? Right. It's meant to regulate uh, scarce resources, mm-hmm. and it has it done a terrible job at that. Um, like, the, the guy was talking about long-distance services. That was only a thing because there was, like, one freaking phone company. <laughs> long-distance phone technology hasn't changed since its inception. Right. The only reason it has gotten better, has worked better, is because we went around that stupid system mm-hmm. that they created at the Bell Company. Sorry. Yeah. Boomers. Freaking boomers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the freaking Bell. They created that Bell Monopoly and they broke the up. Like, well, now there's Southern Bell and Northern Bell. Like, it's not this. The jar. <laughs> because a lot of us, like, 90s kids remember, I'm um, having to put in, like, the stupid, like, uh, what, calling cards or 1010. Yeah. You can call, collect. <laughs> <laughs> 10, 10, 231. Yeah, or whatever dumb technology call long distance on. Right. Which, like I said, the technology haven't changed. Now, granted, we've moved on to voice over IP technology, so you really can't, like, so they it forced them, that competition through cell phones and voice over IP, to force the phone companies to not stop charging for long distance. They right. still put it as a perk. Hey, you get free long distance. But the same tech lets you call from here to let you call anywhere inside the continental United States. It's bull crap. Right. You know, and the, and the same thing was like, well, now you get international calling with voice over IP calling. I don't need international calling. Yeah. Why can I boot up my Discord server and talk to people in New Zealand all the time? Do it on a regular. I talk to people in New Zealand and Sweden right. every day. I mean, Apple invented FaceTime, and then it changed the it changed the whole game. Yeah, they invented FaceTime. I know they did. And the uh, and the um, podcast. They also invented the podcast. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the MP3 player. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm gonna cough now. You do the show. Wait for it. right now. I'm picturing like Galt probably hitting his head on the wall. I was like, no, that's no, the no. oh Galt, good old Galt. But yeah, that, so my whole thing with that net neutrality is like it's this: either way you lose, either way you're screwed. I would prefer moving to a solution that it's it is about as screwed up. At Indiana's liquor laws, it's so convoluted. So much stuff has been tacked on to fix other issues instead of fixing the original issue of the FCC because the FCC is involved. And it just keep you keep tacking things on. And it, I like the idea of taking something off, right? But they're not going to just completely take it off. There's no way they're just going to remove all these rules and not leave something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We know. I. You can both sit there. And you, you. Everyone's like. No, they're gonna they're gonna bring it back. Oh, not all of it. I, they're gonna leave something. They're gonna leave something behind. They're gonna be because that bill is longer than like these four things that it did. Like no, no, that bill is longer than that. Yeah, <laughs> there's something that's leaving behind. All all of it. Like that's that's like libertarians. It, 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 to me, just in all of it, it's like we shouldn't be arguing over FCC regulations. We should be arguing over like why isn't this being passed by Congress? Right. Yeah. Why are we still regulating the internet, which is a series of tubes, yeah. Why based on a 1938 piece of legislation? Yeah. Why should we think it's okay that we should run copper cabling from houses to, to fiber octave cabling? Right. This is dumb. This, like, is, this is dumb. Shouldn't, shouldn't we be trying to change things at the local level? Like, it wouldn't be that hard for me to go knock on 50 neighbors' doors mm-hmm. and then go to my apartment complex and go to AT&T and say, I have 50 people who want to upgrade and change the service. Mm-hmm. What can you help me do? And I could probably do that. Like, but I'm a lazy American who doesn't want to do that work. And like that kind of work yeah. is the essential part of the American democracy mm-hmm. where you basically like if you want to change things at the local level or with the com- at the government level at the company level at the at the housing level like you have to put in some work and people are just sitting here going I don't want to work I don't want to do anything I shouldn't have to and they're part be- they're part it should just be done for me mm-hmm. and let's get the magic man in the government to fix it for me mm-hmm. and to see libertarians like taking that argument mm-hmm. It just it's it's mind boggling. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's like the like uh, like it's weird seeing these faux libertarians sit there and talk about this stuff. Like, well, the FCC needs to regulate this. I'm like, so like every other instance when the government regulates something, it's crap. But this, 
oh, this is they need to regulate. They need to regulate this heavily because their word means something. Yeah, like they they have we have written down the Constitution, mm-hmm. and look at how they've bastardized it. Yep. Look at every piece of look at the Consumer Protection Bureau that we just talked yep. about. Like that has been used for nothing but capital like cronyism, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I have to say, like this argument of cronyism. Uh, if you go and look at open source and the telecom industry and where the donations went, in 2015 you have a Democratic president who has Tom Wheeler, the Democratic appointed chairman of the FCC. It's it's a the FCC is a body that is currently majority Republican, three to two. Mm-hmm. In 2015 it was majority Democrat, so that's how they squeeze this through. Again, it was unconstitutional, in my opinion, for them to make this Title II change in the first place. Um, and I think if you go back and listen to this ep- to this podcast and the episode that we did about it, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's so weird to have, like, the CFPB and the net neutrality stuff coming up, and we've done episodes on it. Yeah. Like, I haven't gone back and listened to the net neutrality episode yet. But but it, it's it's a Democrat FCC that passes this. And if it were such a huge burden on on the telecom industry, mm-hmm. go look at the chart of donations by party on Open Secrets. The the blue spike that happens in 2016 is unreal. I posted it on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Like, if they felt so burdened by the regulations that had been passed in, in 2015, why did they just dump money on them in mm-hmm. 2016 and reward them? And, like, they donated to Hillary Clinton $1.1 million. They donated to Trump $99,000. So she got a million more than Donald Trump. So to argue that Donald Trump is being bought off by the telecom industry to do something in their favor is just ludicrous. Like, if you go to Open Secrets and you actually do your homework... You can destroy the cronyism charge outright because we have the donation records. Like the telecom industry has has donated to the people that are on the oversight, the head of the oversight committee, the people that sit on the oversight committees of the FCC. Mm-hmm. The telecom industry has been raining money on those people for years. So that's the argument against the FCC being the regulatory agency. Because I work in an industry where the... The companies, the radio companies that in 1996 got deregulation and then got a big, like in 96, that's when Clear Channel and Cumulus and all these other companies just started buying up stuff. Mm-hmm. And Clear Channel especially just started like gobbling everything up. Now they have $14 billion in debt and they're looking at a collapse. Yeah. They, they had a, pro- like CBS had a problem employee in Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. And so they managed to help. I firmly believe that CBS and Clear Channel and some of these people who were getting fined by the FCC used those fines to get Howard Stern fired. Like, they're, they're, the FCC isn't a free speech organization. Like, you, it isn't. You, it, it's just, I can tell you, having worked in radio for 15 years, I got in trouble one time because I said scumbag on the air. And I got pulled into an office. I was a baby broadcaster. I'd been there a year. And they said, you can't say scumbag on the air. I said, what are you talking about? I said, scumbag is a term for a, a condom. I go, I have never heard that in my life. And nobody's more perverted than me. Like, I've thought of every dirty joke ever. Like, I've never heard, like, sorry, some people, someone out there may get offended and write a letter and we could get fined. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, so then if an, an innocuous word like scumbag can't be used what can what what are the limits they go we don't know well does the fcc tell you what you can or can't say no it's literally whatever one person like the show that i work for one person got his panties in a bunch about one one comment on the air he he rallied the community the local community to write in uh, a guy by the name of john price wrote in to the fcc with like 50 other people and got them in trouble with the fcc and then you've got to have lawyers and defend yourself, and you're like looking at getting fired, and there's people's jobs online. Like the, what was said wasn't even bad. You know, ha- Bubba the Love Sponge got the single biggest fine in FCC history because he played sound effects of killing a pig. Yeah. He didn't kill a pig, but he still got fined because it went against community standards. Yeah. So, 
we're talking about an organization that can be bought and sold mm-hmm. um, all the time. All the time. It's 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 a political organization like every other bureaucracy in the government, and it is. Why do you think the Janet Jackson thing was a big deal? It's because the head of the FCC was beholden to the Christian right and the Republican administration and mm-hmm. George W. Bush and John Ashcroft and all these people that started like, well, we got to do something about this. And so they started cracking down on this stuff. And mm-hmm. then Michael Powell, the son of Colin Powell, was appointed the next FCC director and ended it. Yep. So, like, let me repeat. The son of the... Secretary of State was then appointed to the head of the FCC. <laughs> Let that sink in. But it's n- it's an organization not given to cronyism. Like, so I I just yep. I have a really hard time getting to the place where I have uh, sympathy for the a- argument that the FCC will be our savior because mm-hmm. I just I've worked in this industry and I've I like like I'm sorry there are some things that I'm an expert on and you guys are not <laughs> and. Like, it's, Harry knows networking security better than I do. Like, this is, the weird thing about this net neutrality argument is that it really shows off the death of the expertise in our society. Like, everybody's an expert now on social media. Yes. And it doesn't matter what my 15 years of radio experience have taught me about the FCC. The other person just is right because they read a few articles. Like... I know that's kind of what we do here, but I also do have 15 years of political experience and have run a political party and run campaigns. Like, there are things that make certain people in our society experts, and we should listen to those people. And, like, that's the crazy thing about the the, the, the social media world right now and the, the Trumpian politics we have. Experts don't count. Yeah. Don't believe experts. Don't believe media. They're all wrong. Just go with your feelings. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very dangerous place to get to. That's a very bad way to craft policy. Your emotions against Comcast, that's a bad way to craft policy. A hypothetical situation that they might do something that happened in England 20 years ago is a bad way to craft policy. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, uh, so uh, that, that, that's kind of where I'm heading with it, but I'd love to hear other people's opinion on it. Technically, everyone that listens, uh, that has a phone, has an FCC <coughs> license. Um, just the fact of owning and doing a phone, you have a GSM transmitting license, which is weird. Um, but you, under certain conditions, it's, yeah, you actually have a license to it's your little GSM device on your phone. Right. Um, the other thing with it is uh, if you think <coughs> that we are exaggerating or, like, misleading, or you really just like, no, the FCC isn't like this, get your ham radio license. Yeah. Get your ham radio license. <laughs> Go through the steps of getting your ham radio license. Meet a couple of hams. Talk to, talk to them. They're a great group of guys, um, except the older ones. Some of the older ones kind of suck. They're a little busy. They're a little, you know, stickler to a lot of the different rules and stuff like that. Um, and they're some of them, and they're boomer narcs and narc on people. Uh, they're, they can be very annoying. But, yeah, go out and get your ham license. It'll be fun. You'll love it. You'll love the entire experience. Just be glad that they finally stopped you making you do Morse code, okay? But you'll love it. It's a fun experience. It's a great skill. And it's a great community, especially when you get to um, go and try to talk to people in different states and stuff like that and get to understand the ham community. But you understand the scrutiny that they're under through the FCC and that how they feel about anyone else violating those rules because they had to jump through all these hoops. Okay, and that is what you're dealing with when you w- deal with anything. So, like the only really free radio you ever get is people doing, you know, like pirate radio. People are out there just like say, "Screw it, I'm ho- I'm hooking up a tower, I'm broadcasting," and those people usually get caught by hams or by people who just rat out the radio signal, you know, and by the FCC. The FCC just kind of like they they will look for snitches to hit them up. All right, so the other thing. Um, Pornhub. I think Pornhub <laughs> hit with this type of thing. They would probably freak out and just make their own, you know, cell towers and just start selling um, private internet service to everybody. And since they can probably charge you at a premium, they just charge you, you know, so you just be premium Pornhub members just to get their internet service. They can let you go to the rest of the internet, but your homepage will be Pornhub and it will be super, super fast, 4K. Okay, <laughs> so you know the idea of like getting other businesses into it, yeah. Because even, like, let's say, like, with Amazon, they're getting, like, they bought all the Whole Foods. That'd be great if they put GSM towers on there and you get Amazon Internet or Walmart, get Walmart Internet. They put GSM towers on all the Walmarts. Uh, they put them on top of the Walmarts. You know, but 
the GSM technology, t- t- transferring internet access that way, that's regulated by the FTC be- because they only want so many different towers. You gotta do this under power brand. It's all the other junk trying to prevent people from abusing which is quote unquote limited resources out there in the radio spectrum. But it's not 4K porn scares me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just okay. wait for uh, VR 4K port, okay? In 100, 120 frames per second, okay? No, thank you. All right? Okay. I, don't, I don't need to be that close. It's um, um, 120 <laughs> frames per second with VR, you know. Like, I don't even need, I don't need 1080, to be honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 90s. So, like, give me that slow-loading 256K port. Have you ever seen 60 frames? No. Oh, man, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> I, as I, I hear, I hear <laughs> that it's beautiful <laughs> from, from, from friends on the internet. That's where I hear it from. You are something else. But the, uh, yeah, that's my thing on, yeah, that's, my, that's my thing on net neutrality. Yeah, there's more layers to this stuff because it's, well, it's the internet. There's tons of several layers. But no, um, the FCC should just get out of the game. That's it. There, There's no such thing as a good regulation. I'm sorry. There's no such thing as a good regulation. I, I Honestly. I don't think, you know, the, the, the biggest thing is to get out of the system, get away from them, and try to work around it. Just like Bitcoin and other things, tr- people trying to use cryptocurrencies outside the internet system or get, a, get around things, those are the people you should support. Those are the, people, those are the actions that libertarians can, should take, okay? It's because if they can, they will, and if they aren't, they're doing it. And because with tender fingers on the button, so they prove to you that the ISPs knows exactly what you're, what you're doing on the network. And they can throttle anything they want. It doesn't do anything like that. They got these levers and switches. Granted, how they're gonna um, and and you're thinking like, well, how are they gonna manage all this traffic? People like me, they're just gonna buy people up like me to use that to throttle traffic to find different things like that. It'll be awesome. I'll get paid a whole bunch of money to throttle traffic. Wouldn't it be great if all these experts got together and wrote some legislation and started talking to like friendly congressmen and start? putting together a piece of legislation... Like, like, I think of the Elizabeth Warren story is really, like, a crazy story, right? So here's this person who is a Harvard professor who writes this paper, and then within just a few years, that paper gets turned into a new agency, Mm -hmm. and then she gets, you know, runs for Senate and wins. Now they're talking about her as a presidential candidate. Like, that's... Like that that should on so, like even though it's Elizabeth Warren and she's a socialist, like that should inspire you to to action. Like it is it, we sometimes sit there and think, Oh, the Leviathan is too big, it's too strong. But it's super easy sometimes to make change. Like sometimes you just get really lucky and then all of a sudden something happens and then you're in the Senate in four years. Yeah. You know, and if if we're in this moment where there's this you know, we're go. What's what's going to happen is the courts are going to end up deciding how the internet is regulated. That that to me isn't the best outcome. Like we can sit here and argue about the philosophy of net neutrality or the the FCC and who and how they should regulate it and all these hypotheticals. But that's part of what this show is about: is not arguing the hypotheticals, but let's look at the reality of the situation and then try to make decisions about that. Yep. Because you and I can sit here and argue about, do you want to be a minarchist? Do you want to be an anarchist? Do you want to be a, a mutualist? Like, that's all fine and good, but we're probably not going to have, like, true, that decision in our lifetime. anarcho monarchist really. We, right. We could. We could. We could get lucky, but, like, probably the, the history tells us that, like, we're not going to see an anarcho-capitalist America in our lifetime, but... So let's let's work within the framework and advocate for as much liberty within that framework that we have now, and then also keep an eye on philosophy and making sure we're pure, but and making sure that we understand the principles because it's easy to like drift and start advocating like we're not left and we're not right. We're not like some some people have written in and said it's hard for me to connect with you guys because I'm a conservative and I'm trying to find where we have common ground. And I agree with you on some stuff, but some stuff you guys are just wrong. It's like, well then we're just not going to agree. Like, we don't, And we don't have to. Yeah. You can sit there and go, libertarians are right about like 90% of stuff. 
And there are liberals that are probably listening right now, and they go, yeah, that, that North Korea part was really right on. Mm-hmm. But I didn't agree with the consumer protection part. And the conservatives will flip-flop. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it, we're here to be libertarians. We're not here to be conservatives or, demo, or liberals. Like, but the reality is, what is Ajit Pai doing? Is it a good thing? And let's discuss that. Right. Not these hypothetical situations, because that's not really doing any good. That's not doing society any good. It's not doing you any good. Like, you're sitting there. If you're anything like me, you're sitting there on your phone arguing with people on Facebook at 9 o'clock at night, getting so pissed off that you can't fall asleep for two hours. Like, what good did that do me? It didn't do me any good. (laughs) Like, it didn't do them any good. It didn't do any, you know. So, it because we weren't arguing the facts, we weren't arguing what was what's happening. We were arguing hypotheticals and gener- general philosophy and mm-hmm. what ifs. Mm-hmm. And well, they did it, so you can too. And logical fallacies. Mm-hmm. And it's just mm-hmm. like it's this <laughs> weird place that we're in. And it's just like shut up, get to work. Everyone summons their straw hat megazords and they fight <laughs> each other. Right. Like I'd much rather spend my time in Discord. Yeah, isn't that a nice place? With, with all my f- fellow We Are Libertarians nerds. <laughs> if you haven't joined the Discord, you should. It's a lot of fun. So, kind of g- wrap us up on the, the the net neutrality. Okay. Just like you earlier said, try to argue the facts. Look at what's going on. And the other thing is, like, when it comes down to it, it's... If you believe that, if you know, if the government regulations hinders business stops innovation in every other area, but this one area isn't, and you want to readdress what you're really doing and what you're really thinking about in this area, and think you may have been sold in like a crappy hill of beans on this. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that the ISPs aren't bad actors, and that do not, no, not do bad things. They sure do, but they're protected by, once again, regulation. So removing these regulations, moving barriers, the, the government stops re- and removes these barriers of entry to allow more small time uh, uh, cell phone carriers or more broadband access to different areas or different high speed access or just access to or level three gets us better access to the fiber. That's the better case. That's the case you should be going on to to get people access around these ISPs that want to do these actors because they're going to throttle or do what they want in an area and they're going to do what they want. Unless they have competition, you know, the prices are going to stay skyrocketing and they're going to go higher. And if you think you're going to get around them by cutting the cable, you are wrong. They will just raise the price on bandwidth. Or, just like Comcast did, put data caps on it. You can only do 500, you know, gigs a month on your home data line. Just watch. They've done it. People have freaked out. But it's, you know, just like net neutrality and everything else, it's just going to come back around until you're ready to accept it. That's what she said. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, once again, like I said, uh, got jump on the Discord. It gets um, um, the DMZ goes hard in the paint sometimes, so just be careful. You can stay on the starter safe zone as long as you want. You don't have to go into other channels. If you have a request for a different channel, like uh, or you just want to stay in the sports channel, or yeah, we talk sports. We also do e- there's some econ talks inside there, um, and like I said, the DMZ it's just like that. It's a debilitarized zone, and it's. Shots are just firing everywhere from all different sides. Any other thoughts for this podcast? We really do hope that um, Pornhub does show people up and makes their own ISB one day. That'd be awesome. It'd be amazing, just like they did the snowplows. Or right. and another thing, and next time anyone um, and I always like to joke. My funny joke I like to say when people's like, "Well, the internet to be regulated like um, a city utility." I like to bring up Flint, Michigan. <laughs> But yeah, all right, I'm done. All right, thanks for joining us here on this episode. I want to sh- thank our Patreon supporters. Uh, Harry, last week, right as we signed off, goes, did you do the Patreon thank you? I was like, yeah, of course I did. I did not. Uh, so thanks to Christy Avery, Craig DeCosta, and Jason Doolittle, who, who donate $100 a month. Uh, they're beloved, beloved people. Uh, Brantley Spicer, Joey Tarner, Pete Jones, Carly Ernst, Bryn Kester, Heidi Albridge, Christian Emmons, Dan Dunbar, Doug Stream, Christopher Brokoff, and Todd Singer, thank you guys for donating $25 a month. You can also donate $10, 5 or $1 a month at Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Uh, you are helping support this program, and you are also uh, you are getting some cool stuff 
especially extra content. We are going to be recording another League of Liberty podcast, which is my friends Mark Clare of Lions of Liberty, Johnny Rocket from the Johnny Rocket Launchpad, Roger Paxton from Lava Flow. We will be recording a third episode of the League of Liberty tomorrow night, and that will be the bonus content this week. So we've, we've done two, and uh, they've been very exciting. So be sure to, to get that. That's, uh, that's like an hour and a half of extra content. So if you love this show and you love the kind of stuff that we do, then you will love that. So thank you for joining me, Harry. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. This was fun. I appreciate it. Uh, all right, and I appreciate all of you for listening. And until then, be good to each other. <coughs> Never your stance, you waffled on the net. <laughs>